Hello, uh, my name is uh, Professor Kevin Hilton. I'm the independent chair of the Sheffield Race Equality Commission. I am based at Leeds Beckett University, where I was head of the Research Centre for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and more recently the Interim Pro Vice Chancellor, Culture, Equality and Inclusion at the University of Sussex. The Race Equality Commission is a uh, non-partisan strategic assessment uh, into the nature, extent, causes and impacts of racism and racial disparities in Sheffield. Working with 24 commissioners from the Sheffield area, we conducted a series of short, focused uh, hearings over six priority areas uh, for uh, the city. These included business and employment, civic life and communities, crime and justice, education, health, sport and culture. In May 2022 we will be presenting the findings and recommendations for the report that will be made available to the public on the uh, Sheffield City Council website. This is the education hearing part one. Good morning everybody. I'm Adele Robinson and a member of the Race Equality Commission Secretariat. Before I introduce the chair, I'll give you some context about the work of the commission. The commission itself is an inquiry into the nature, extent, causes and impact of race inequality and racism in Sheffield. The commission was established to focus on six key themes, health, education, civic life and communities, business and employment, crime and justice and sport and culture. Today is the first day of the education theme. At the culmination of the hearings, a final report will be submitted for action to key stakeholders in Sheffield. The Commission has invited witnesses today to share their experiences and insights into the terms of reference for the Commission. And this includes sharing their knowledge of racial inequality and racism in Sheffield, which may be of use to the Commission, knowledge of their own approaches to race related equality duties and frameworks, any analysis of the causes of racism and racial inequality within their sector, examples of good practice in relation to reducing racism and racial inequality, and what you believe to be the best way to tackle racism and racial inequality within the city. Any witnesses are required to act in good faith and by speaking today, we, you agree that this is so. Please note for those in attendance that the hearing is being recorded and it will be available afterwards. Only commissioners will be able to ask any questions, but any papers, minutes, non-confidential evidence will be made available on the Commission's website afterwards. Please note for commissioners, please await an invitation from the Chair before speaking, and can you please introduce yourself before speaking. And if you want to ask a question, can you put that in the chat and I will send that on to the Chair. I'll now hand the proceedings over to the Chair, Professor Kevin Hilton. Thank you. Morning. Morning, everyone. Uh, Abdul, can I... Can you hear me? You're on mute at the moment. Yeah, I can hear you. OK, can you take... Are you, wishing, are, you to... wishing, are you wishing to use video as well, Abdul? Yes, I can use it, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, Kevin. OK. Uh, Abdul, just whilst we are um, waiting for your, your video to come through, as you know, we, we have met before, so you, you know I'm the independent chair of the Race Quality Com Commission. I'm joined, as you can see, by uh, members of the Education Working Group and other, commission, uh, and other commissioners. Um, I will invite them to ask uh, questions at uh, an appropriate juncture. There you are. Good to see you, Abdul. Great to see you. I was wondering um, where I was, but thanks, you found me now. <laughs> yeah. So, so Abdul, um, 
in in a sec, I'd like you to, to if you can, make a sh make a short statement about ACT. I, I'm just I'm just uh, reiterating to uh, commissioners and to anyone watching that you'll be joining the commission twice. You will be coming back as a member of the Bema COVID nineteen action group in the civic life and communities uh, hearing. Um, but for today, you are uh, uh, coming with your ACT CEO hat on. Um, so I wonder if you, Abdul, if you could make a short statement about about ACT and your and your role within it. Um, but before doing, could you please share your your name, organisation, and the capacity uh, in which you're, you're you're attending today? Um, you you have already submitted evidence as part of the Bema COVID group. So um, so we'll be looking. To, uh, today to be focusing in on ACT and ACT work around education. So, so Abdul, uh, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, my, my name is Abdul Shaif, uh, and I'm the Chief Executive of ACT, which is Aspiring Communities Together. Aspiring Communities Together is an organization that was born out of the Yemeni community uh, in 1971. It used to be called the Yemeni Workers' Union, then it became the Yemeni Community Association in 86, and in 2001 it became Aspiring Communities Together. And the reason for the big change is because while it was primarily focused on the Yemeni community in 71 and in 86, in 2001, it became an organization that's serving the whole community. So it became aspiring communities together. So it's just a bit of history about how we've started, but we have been running since 1971. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Abdul. I'm going to turn proceedings over to uh, Olivier uh, uh, Sim, who you know. Um, Olivia, could you uh, introduce yourself, please, and then proceed with your questions? Morning, Abdul. My name is Olivier Temo, and I'm a commissioner on the Sheffield Race Equality Commission. Abdul, what are the persistent social, economic, and educational barriers that BAME people face? It's a very difficult question because we, we, we face a lot of barriers. Um, I'm only going to be speaking about that in terms of where I'm coming from, which is ACT, because specifically uh, this interview is, is, is about that. I'll probably be speaking about the general aspect of it uh, in, in, the June, in the June interview. Uh, so for us as, as, as aspiring communities together, we've had great difficulties in, in, in our development as an organization. Even though we're, 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 we're a medium-sized organization with a budget of, say, half a million a year, we have 35 members of staff uh, and we have eight provisions going on uh, within, within the organization, eight community provisions. Uh, but the struggle and the difficulties have been huge. Uh, since 1971 until now, growing this organization. I'm sure uh, uh, Olivia, my colleague, uh, will probably identify very similar difficulties with Sadaka or the PMC or Israq, or for that matter, any other black organization that has developed, because there's a lot of new organizations that have developed in the meantime, but I, I'm definitely sure that they're facing the same struggles and the same issues in terms of development. So what are those issues that we are we are, we are we are facing. We are facing an uphill battle in terms of funding and resources. Uh, there's a great deal to be said about uh, the kind of work that we do, uh, its impact in the community and the resources that we get for that work. Uh, and I'll give you an example because you're an educational panel. I'll give you one example. For example, we have a community language school in, in ACT of 250 kids probably one of the biggest community language schools in the country, uh, well-renowned for the work that it's done. Much of the GCSE results that come out in mainstream schools, and they're very good results for, 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 for Arabic children in that particular subject, is not because of the work that's happening in the mainstream school, it's because of the work that's happening in the community language school, but yet it's unrecognized. Yeah, it's unrecognized. So we have 250 kids, 14 teachers and one head teachers. And to answer your question again, uh, my colleague Olivia, yeah, these 14 teachers, for example, uh, are not trained as teachers, as professional 
teachers. Uh, they are not given the, the, the opportunity to train and, 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 and become real teachers. Instead, they're community teachers. So for a very, very long time, since the establishment of, of the Sheffield Unified Multicultural Education Service, nobody has touched these teachers. Nobody has given them the proper training they require to be able to train within the curriculum, within the curriculum standards and within professional standards. So, so the community language school has no funding from anybody. Contrary to popular belief, because a lot of people might come and say, these communities get a lot of funding. Well, we don't have any funding for the Arabic school. The only funding that we have for that community language school is money that's, that's being given from parents. Parents are making a contribution towards that. So we get £18,000 a year from parents to run that school, but that school costs us uh, £86,000 a year to run. So where does the rest of the money come? Well, it comes from little pots there and then, and we're constantly in a fight to try and keep it going. And there's no real support. Yeah, it's an educational provision. It's an educational provision. That should be a mainstream provision. That should be funded in the same way schools are funded, because these are kids that are coming three nights a week after school study support to learn community language. Now, I know there is a debate about how important is uh, Arabic and Urdu and Creole in terms of language, uh, how important they are in terms of German, German, French, and the, well, I think they're more important. I actually think that the economic language of the future is Arabic and Urdu and, and, and Creole and all these other languages, because the global economy is working all over the world. And unless we produce the translators and interpreters, they'll be able to get into that system, that we're not going to do a good job in terms of marketing. So for me, it's as equally as important as French and German, even more important. The other two reasons why it's important is because it's the communication of language in the home. This is what people yeah. speak to in their parents. I'm going to have to keep you quiet, guys. Um, uh, sorry, because I'm in the office and we're working, so my, my apologies for that if you're hearing noises from the back. So that's another important thing. These young kids go back to their own countries in the future. They will need to speak the language, otherwise they're lost. And the third thing is that it gives them a sense of identity of who they are. Uh, kids are much more stronger when they have identity, when they know who they are, when they know what their language is. So I, I, I actually think it's, it's, it's as important it for the economic language. It's also important for home. It's also important for when they go back to their own country, but it's also important for engaging in the economic uh, struggle. Uh, and, and, and I just wanted to make something clear to the panel. No one funds these community language schools, and there's 32 of them, 68 languages spoken in Sheffield, 32 community language schools, and there's no funding, neither from the council, nor the university, nor the home office. Now, when, when we organized the Multicultural Education Service, SUMES, in 1994, as I recollect, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, we did, we did uh, develop these teachers. We did get some money into these community language schools. We did uh, have an association of community language schools. So they had a, an umbrella organization called the Association of Community Language Schools that looked at the training, that looked at the, 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 the needs of those children, that actually visited those schools, that made them an umbrella organization. When Sumez was wiped out, that was wiped out with it as well. So in a sense that section 11 funding, which I think was critical during the days of Mike Atkins, Ahmed Gurner, and I think Malcolm was, was involved, uh, Zahir Hamid, uh, Dalji, there were so many people involved. There, was, there seems to be a really good fight there to get the system to respond to the communities, yeah? I'm afraid that we've gone backwards, uh, Olivia. That, that situation is no longer exists. These community language schools are back to where they were in 71 and 72, because I can talk from my knowledge, I don't know about Creole, whether it still exists, but ours only existed because of the struggle of people in the community. They haven't existed because of the struggle of the people in the council or the university or, or the education department. They've done nothing, nothing whatsoever. This is only alive because the community has kept it alive. And I'm hoping that the new generation of young people are gonna see the importance of this and keep these these uh, provisions going. Yeah. Olivier, can I ask you if you're going to follow up on, on any of those points? Because we do have a follow up question from Yes. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Abdul, for your comprehensive response to uh, that first question. That's very telling. Uh, Abdul, uh, Sorry, can, what is ACTI role as a community center for education? Olivier, can you just hang on, hang on one sec? Can I, I'd like to just follow up with a um, with a couple of points around that those introductory comments, <clears throat> which, as you say, were, were, were super uh, comprehensive. 
Yen, can I just, can I just, Olivia, can I just ask Yen to ask a follow-up question, please? Hi, Abdul. My name is Yen Fongling. I'm an artist and I'm a senior lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University. You mentioned at the beginning in your uh, comments um, that there was a suggestion that monitoring of your success from your community is being co-opted by, you know, a kind of a larger monitoring about the success of your community of students. Um, how would you counter this? What needs to be done? You know, because the implication of that means that if, if well, effectively, it might be a, a kind of whitewashing of the success of your, of your community school. Um, so how do you counter that? What would make you be more visible in this process, do you think? I, I think that, that th there's a constant struggle within the community to make sure that the community language school uh, uh, has, has paramount importance in the work of the community. So within the community, we have no problem. The, the community language school is quite famous. Yeah? Everybody wants to bring their kids here, including doctors, nurses, uh, engineers. You know, they bring their kids to, to, to learn, mainly mm. because it's very cheap. They only pay £100 a year for that kid to come and get that education, which is which has been the reason why we've made it so cheap is because most of their parents are on universal credit that come mm. here. So we've had to make it according to their standard. Uh, but the way it, 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 it's got prominence within the UK, because because naturally it's one of the biggest schools and people come from Birmingham to see what we're doing. Yeah? But it hasn't got prominence within the system. Yeah. Within the system, has got no prominence at all. If you ask any university lecturer or Sheffield Council officer and tell them, do you know anything about 32 community language schools? They'll probably say no. Yeah. Because that's as so, much as they know. <laughs> exactly. So, so Abdul, can, can you just t tell me who, who do you monitor the success of this in relationship to who? Uh, which funding body or organisation do you tell of the success of this school? Well... For community language school, we've tried to apply anyway. I mean, we've got we've got people as a result of the struggle have become expert funding, fund, looking for funding. Mm. They become experts at it, but because it's a community language, nobody wants to fund it. Yeah, because it's teaching Arabic for in our in our, in our situation, and for the Pakistani community, it's Urdu. For the Afro Caribbean, it's probably Creole, it's, uh, and the Chinese community. For that, for those community languages, no funder is interested. So we've had blocks. Uh, we've had tons of applications that have gone in, but no money has come has come in for that. Mm, mm, Mainly mm. because it hasn't got the prominence. Uh, let's say as work in adult education in English, or if we were teaching people English, we'd probably get money for that. Yeah, but not because it's Arabic. That 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 prominence hasn't got through yet. So uh, the way we monitor it, we monitor it according to the results that the kids have got in mainstream school for Arabic and and even in mainstream school, Arabic and Urdu are add-on subjects. They're not mm. they're not curriculum main subject. It's a choice that they have to take. They have to take one European language or one community uh, language. And many of the kids choose to do Arabic and Urdu mainly because they know that they're getting the support in that in the, in the community school to be able to pass with with golden colours. And there, if you look at the results in that, mm -hmm. and I'm ho I'm sure that you will do as part of the, uh, whoever is is, is, is uh, uh, supporting your your other. We'll have a look at the results of the Arabic uh, in schools. We'll be very surprised. Why have these kids got so well? They've got A's and B's in Arabic and in Urdu, but they've not mm. got A's and B's in maths and English. Sure, and sure. my my answer is the reason for that, which hasn't been prominent, is because of the work that's going on in the community mm, mm. does that make sense it does make sense yeah. and um my questioning is about how you potentially could map a line of structural shifts and differences that could uh that result in the way that there is a kind of invisibility around what you do so maybe i'm not going to continue the line of questioning but to hand back over to olivia but thank you for your answer um, Olivia, if you just bear with me, I, I am conscious that, that there is a, a question waiting from Kaltum, and Kaltum, I'll bring you in shortly, um, but uh, I will go over to you, Olivier, but it seems, but I'll, I'll if you can just indulge me as chair, uh, Abdul, you talk, you, you talk about how, you know, some of these students are achieving really well in terms of these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, languages. Um, Urdu, Creole, Arabic, Chinese. Could you tell me that, well, 
how many languages do you cover in the school? We cover the Arabic language, just one language. Okay. Right. So, um, but it seems to me that where they're achieving, where some are achieving highly at within the community with, with you, but perhaps not so well at school, there, there is an, an additional kind of element to, to your work, and that is he's just contributing to the love of learning through 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 languages as well and this is this is quality qualitative this is this goes beyond numbers and i i wonder whether you you have any uh anecdotal uh evidence or reports or or anything material that we might be able to access where the students are actually talking about how much they enjoy the work that they do with you yes i mean our, 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 uh, to be honest with you, this is something that we wanted to do with the university. We, we, we asked the university to come and do as a report about how, how, what are the, the, the issues in the Arabic school that we're facing, what are the challenges, how well we're doing. But we still haven't got that, that report yet done. Uh, I have, got, uh, I have uh, got reports that we've written. On, on the community language schools, we can show that 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 that, that evidence. Uh, but also, we've got the work of the kids that we do in the Arabic school. And if you and the board will ever want to do a visit, we're open again. If you ever want to do a visit, you're quite welcome to have a look uh, because it's not just about the quantity. The quantity is huge. I mean, how many people knew there were 250 kids three nights a week in ACT? Not many people know that, yeah? You'll know there are 250 kids in a primary school, yeah? Because that information is readily uh, available. Uh, so my, 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 we, we, we've got plenty of information that you can come and have a look at. Uh, reports haven't been written mainly because we've not had the time to write reports, uh, mainly because we've been dependent on the university and the council to come and help us do that. And I think that they should do that. We were doing that in the 90s. We began to do that because we had a Yemeni action group, a Somali action group, at the time uh, we had an afro-caribbean action group and these action groups were doing all this this work that has as far as i know has disappeared as well okay so can i just uh, just ask about the university research is this an ongoing piece of work or or is there an issue with the with the project i have asked the university to, uh, so, uh, from the uh, university to come and help us do that i'm waiting for a response from them okay thank you um olivier thank you very much abdul did, did you know your video has has come off Ad, abdul i'm back i think i'm back yes Brilliant. thank you uh, olivier over to you yeah thank you chair uh, abdul talking about community training why do you think it's necessary and why do you need to provide it rather than the local authority well I don't mind the local authority providing training uh, if it's if it's done in cooperation with with the community. Uh, I, I think we are we are we, we we are more than capable of providing training to the local authority, uh, particularly to staff in the local authority about community. But I think the local uh, authority has a lot to contribute to us in terms of training and professional areas uh i'm going back to act again rather than the generality of things we haven't had any training for the last five years that i've been involved again in the community because i took 10 years off and i came back on uh we haven't had any training from the local authority to help us in any of the uh, of the provisions that we're dealing with. We have a, a healthy living centre, uh, we have uh, adult education, we have uh, the community language school, which I've been talking about uh, uh, for quite a bit. We have work with young people. Uh, we've not had anybody come and say, right, we, we will support you with some with some training, yeah, or where we could provide it cooperatively together. So this area of training is a very important area, which I think, again, I'm going to go back to the 90s, was happening in magnificently. There was training in how to run community centres. There was training on how to uh, to to to, uh, to get fundraising. All these things did happen, but at a flash of a point, they seem to have disappeared. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, my next question, Abdul, what is the biggest challenge facing community learning in Sheffield today? I think the biggest challenge is the resource base. And I'm sorry to say this, but, but every organization that I know runs with a deficit. Every organization that I know that I'm working with within the black community is running with a deficit. Our deficit is 45,000 a year, which means that if I was made to make people redundant, I would not be able to pay them. 
and then the organization would go into bankruptcy. Every organization is running on a deficit. I mean, every organization that is operating within the charity commission rules and is doing things properly will be in a situation where they have to pay redundancies, yeah, where they have to look after their employees. And we are all having the difficulty of getting our resource base sorted out. And that's the reason is, as you know, Oliver, because you're in the same situation as I am, yeah? The reason is that we are constantly applying for funding. Most of the time we are refused. And when we are giving money, we're given for a small period of time. It's not mainstream. It's not mainstream uh, funding that we're getting. So we're all facing the same. So the biggest challenge is resources, uh, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, my next question, Abdul. Can you say a bit more about your work with Black, Asian and minority ethnic young people and issues related to those who have been excluded and your approach with them? Yeah, I mean, I've spent my whole life uh, since the age of 14 when I chaired the Yemeni community, uh, so it's struggling. I've spent all my life working with, with, with other people. In fact, a large part of my life has been given to, to the community and not just to the Yemeni community. I've given it to, to a number of black uh, communities uh, uh, in general. I mean, we set up the Black Committee Forum uh, early 90s. We, uh, we set up uh, the Bema COVID-19 group uh, when the pandemic happened. Uh, and I meet a lot of people from different communities and, and, and we're able to join together at a time of crisis. We're able to work together when we can. Uh, but everybody has challenges. And every time I meet the groups in Burma COVID-19 or in the Black Community Forum, we're all in the same boat about, about uh, funding, about resources, about developing our organizations. Uh, there's a real conscious struggle that people want to develop within their community. They feel much more comfortable about developing provision within their community. Uh, and I think to some extent, uh, despite all the difficulties that we've had, Olivia, uh, I actually think we've been quite successful. I actually think even if you look at even if you look at the people that we put through, you know, to, uh, politically, uh, the young people that's come through, whether it's Ibtisam Muhammad, whether it's Abdul Khayyum, whether it's Mazar Iqba, they've come through our struggle. They've come through community uh, struggle. They haven't come from just like that. They've come through the struggles that we've had. I mean, uh, almost 90% of the people that I know are in politics have come through community struggles. Uh, and I can see some, some, some here as well. We, we struggle in the community with those challenges, whether it's unemployment, whether it's skills-based, uh, whether it's supporting the elderly, yeah, we we come through these struggles in, in 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 with some really good results, and these results are that, that we have got people in the system, we have developed people. I mean, Sumez, for example, the Sheffield Union had multi developed 470 teachers into the system. I know some of these. Teachers now have become head teachers, yeah, or two or three of them have become head teachers. I mean, again, that's a fantastic development that we that we had uh, in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, it's 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 gone. It's disappeared as part of austerity and as part of all the cuts, yeah. But we do some. We do need a replacement. We do need to look at the system again and see how we can support our young people better at school and outside school. How we can move them away from knives and crimes and drugs there's, there's so much that we can that we can be be doing but i'm afraid at the moment the system is a bit detached from the community yeah it's not that the community is detached from the system the system is detached from the community and that in itself requires a great i mean the pandemic when it came uh, uh, we we organized ourselves on, on march 12 2020 yeah way before the council had organized itself so black communities were able to set up bema covid 19 and provide food parcels to the vulnerable and to the community and give them advice and pick up their prescriptions and help 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 uh, many people in them their isolation uh, by doing the helpline they did this in march 12 2020 yeah, which is at least three months before the council started delivering. Yeah, I know, I know it's been recognized and all the MPs have written saying how wonderful the black community is, but Olivia, that happened without funding. I know because I set up the group, it happened without funding. There was no funding whatsoever. All that work was delivered. Funding came about six months later. Yeah, Abdul. and the funding that came came for vaccination COVID. Sorry. Abdul, sorry, I, I, I know it's it's tempting to, to discuss the BAMO work because it's been so important and, and so significant in, in Sheffield. We'll get into that in, in more depth in that in the civic life and communities hearing. But I'd like to I'd like I, I'd just like to check with Malcolm whether he wishes to ask his question about Sumez or whether he's happy with what Abdul has said already.
you can you can come off mute any time. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to ask the question on Sumis. Um, do you want me to do it now? Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, um, Abdul. Um, what do you think is the impact of losing Sumis in it to your school or you know the um, the art communities? I, I I think the impact has been huge. I mean, I, 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 I worked for Sumis and I worked within the community. So looking back and looking at now, there's hardly any support either for black teachers, black kids or black communities. Hardly any support. Yeah, the schools have become independent in their own right. Most of them are academies. And, 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 and some of them are just too focused and too concerned on what's happening inside the schools. No one is concerned about what's happening in the community. So I think that gap that's been created by, by the absence of Tumis has been absolutely huge, Malcolm. So for those people who don't know about Sumez, could you say just a little bit, just briefly about what Sumez did? Sumez was, uh, was, uh, as, uh, came up as a result of Section 11 funding. That was Home Office funding in 92, 93. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, the, the guy that should be credited with much of the work around, around that is somebody called Malcolm Atkins. I don't know whether, uh, whether, whether you Mike have Atkins. any. Mike yeah. Atkins. Yeah, whether you, any of you have any. But he was able to, to, to bring the money from the Home Office under Section 11. It was about three million pounds at the moment to actually fund Sumez. And Sumez was, was 470 teachers, uh, support teachers who were given to schools to support those kids that were struggling either in their own English language or in their community language or in their pastoral work uh, and behavioural work. And those teachers were trained to become mainstream teachers. So the schools had a big, massive positive action push of getting these 447, 470 into, into the system, something you, you would never have had you would never have had without Sumers. Yeah. Unfortunately, many of those teachers have disappeared when, when Sumers disappeared, but some of them have stayed in mainstream. So the impact is long lasting. I do believe that the impact is still positive until today. And, and Abdul, sorry, Malcolm, and Abdul, have any of those, those teachers got those support workers gone on to become teachers? Yes, some have, yes. yes. Yeah, I would say a percentage, a good 20%, 30% of them have become teachers, yes. Okay. And two of them have become head teachers. One is in King uh, King Egbert. Okay, who we'll be speaking to later on today. Thank you, Abdul. Yes, that's a good segue for us. Um, Sh Sharon, were you going to ask a question in directly in response to this? Oh no, sorry. I was just going to say that I'm one of the, I'm one of the Sumis team. Ah uh, yes, I remember. Um, remember Abdul? <laughs> yes. Hello. You okay. Solidarity. <laughs> Yeah, it's me. Yeah. We're, we're an endangered species. <laughs> obviously, obviously. Yeah, okay, that's it, sorry. Well, it, it's good to see success upon success here. Um, can I just ask, yeah, before we bring Olivier in, who's been very patient, um, can I just ask um, uh, Caltum and then Yen to ask their questions? Carlton, yes. um, hello. Uh, thanks, Abdul. It's good to hear you here today. Um, well, my question was just literally straightforward. Um, as your schools, we would be thinking that there's an enrichment, there's a contribution to children's attainment in the mainstream school. So let's not forget the, the contribution the community does for our children to have attainment and achievement that is um, to be either celebrated um, or to be acknowledged. Do you think that the, that's acknowledged and recognized by the, by the education department in the council? No, not at all. Uh, in fact, for five years, I don't think anyone has visited the community language school, even though there are 250 kids who go to mainstream school inside that school. Uh, no one has visited them. No one has put forward any suggesting about uh, 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 encouraging them, uh, uh, organizing uh, uh, 
uh, a day for them where they can get certificates from the council for the education department, uh, despite having put this in almost every meeting that I go to. And I'm in constant struggle with, with both councillors and politicians and, and, and officers uh, about this. It's not that, that we've kept quiet, we've been in constant struggle, but they're not listening at the moment into that into that area, mainly because they don't think it's their responsibility. When when Sumers was in the council, it was different because you had officers in the council, yeah, that were putting pressure on other officers to move things forward and recognize that there is a problem out there. Now we're not in the council, we're outside the council. I mean, we rely on people like you, uh, Councillor Rivers, but we're outside the council. But it's not that we're not shouting, we're shouting and screaming, but the importance of it, the prominence of this subject is not there. Yeah, and it's how you get it there. That's going to be the big, big issue. Kelton, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I was just going to uh, thank you, Abdullah, and thank you, Kevin. Um, what would you, what would like at the moment, what we're looking at is you've given the community so much, you've given children and young people education outside their mainstream schools and and thank you for answering the question as direct as possible. And what would you like to happen then um, after now? And what actions would you want to take in addressing it? As a new turn the leaf and let's recognize and talk, what would you now do without going back to the what happened before? To be honest, uh I, I would say that, that the problem now, what to do, is probably more your problem as a commission than, 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 than our problem, because we can only do so much, yeah? But people in the community, and I'm going to be honest, I've already said this to Kevin previously, are looking forward to this commission to have an impact on the system, yeah. because something radical, really radical, needs to happen to change the way things are to a situation where we, we feel that we're in a better position. And I don't mean the Yemeni community, I mean the whole community. I mean, there are white working class people that are struggling equally as much as we're struggling as well in the areas that we're, we're, we're living in and working in, and they need support too. But I think it's about the community being listened to, community provision being recognized, and the council creating something, I think similar to Sumer's again. Yeah, the council with, with, with the government needs to look at ways of getting a big income stream into the council uh, to be able to develop community language schools, to be able to develop training, to be able to, rather than allowing the communities to 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 beg for uh, 2,000 pounds from there one time, we've become like beggars. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I see myself as doing a fantastic job within the community. In fact, it's a it's a life sacrifice as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, we're like beggars looking for that small grant there, that small grant to keep this teacher going, to keep these materials going, to keep the classroom going, to pay the heating, to pay the bills. We, we feel as a community, we've become like beggars looking for funding. And on, and this this funding that's coming, it, it, it's not targeted. It's not strategic. It's not, part, you know, Sumer's was a very strategic thing. It had a very clear aim of what, uh, what it was. And I'm not seeing anything like that. Uh, in, the, in the 90s, Kultum, just for your information, in the 90s, we had a plan to have community buildings. Yeah, and that's how we got Israq, uh, Soma, uh, uh, PMC, uh, Yemeni Center, uh, Sadaka. We had a plan that the community must have must have buildings and all that. I mean, of, of course, that plan has gone all wrong now because we've got the responsibility of keeping these buildings going. And that's a, that's a big issue, yeah? Because uh, nobody wants to fund them, including the SIL, the SIL department, where you have uh, levy investment money that's coming through to the council and we've had none of it, nothing. No black community has been able to get anything for their building. So all these buildings that we're in are falling down in pieces, yeah? And yet there's there's no funding because again, it's not prominent enough. People don't see that as, 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 uh, as an important aspect of their work. Uh, so again, they're, 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 there we are. Uh, it's a very difficult situation indeed, Kultum. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Abdul and Kelton, for those questions. Jen, we'll come back to you in a, in a little while. Um, Abdul, it seems to me that there's a, there is a, a, a big issue around a sense of belonging and a sense of inclusion, because what you've been talking about is is being being recognised, being seen, being heard, and and being valued. You know, just to kind of boil down boil down what what you've said, um, and that's you know, and clearly there is a job of work for the commission to be able to articulate what it is 
you've said today and what it is other people will be saying over the course of the uh, the whole inquiry process but we do appreciate your candor uh, this uh, this morning um, i'm going to turn proceedings back to olivier who's as i say been very patient thanks olivier thank you chair uh, abdul talking about our young learner who have been excluded from main school education how do you measure the learning, the progress, and do you feel that the current way you are educating the learners fully prepare them to the need of the 21st century Britain? That's a very difficult question because I don't think that we're preparing them for a better life because like I said again, we don't have the resources. Kids that are excluded from schools are probably the ones that are getting missed out at the moment. They're the ones that we're not focusing on. Uh, schools just kick them out uh, and then they they have nowhere to go. They join gangs, they get into drugs, they get into all these difficulties. We work within the Yemeni community. We've got a number of these, these kids that are falling beyond the net. Uh, and there's very little support for them because once schools exclude them, yeah, they get picked up by an in inclusion centre and then they get put uh, into, into a community centre or whatever. That system doesn't necessarily work for everybody, nor does it work for those kids that are, that are there. So we're, we want to develop a programme now and we, we've started thinking ourselves about how to make sure that we can do it either to the community language school that we've got or to the community. How do we engage these kids to get them out of this difficult situation there because they have been failed by schools and I know you can't push a policy of non-exclusion but I wish I could I wish that in every school there's a policy of non-exclusion of where the kids have got somewhere else to go rather than have eight hours a day free at home you know giving their parents hell or ending up in, in, in hot waters in very difficult situation but we do have I know it's more of a, a bigger case in the Afro-Caribbean community uh, and I hope I can help in that too. But I do think that, you, that we've got much bigger problem within the Afro-Caribbean community. But also young Yemenis and Pakistanis are also getting, particularly in Nether Edge, Perth Park and Pedro, they're getting involved uh, in, in, in these situations of where we need to help out. Uh, I don't think that the community is prepared uh, uh, to, to be, I don't think the community is prepared resourcefulness, in terms of resourcefulness, to be able to deal with that problem, uh, Olivia. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we have two or three cases a week on that, yeah, and the time that's given is quite a lot, yeah, and you don't, you, the, the volunteers are very, you're very short of volunteers, so unless we work with the local authority very closely on exclusion, and how we help these young people, we're not going to get very far in that. And I think, again, for the past few years, we've lost out on that quite a lot. Yeah. Um, Abdul, thanks for thanks for all the energy you're bringing to the to the session this morning. I I am looking looking at the time, and what I want to try to do now is to bring a few of the the, the other commissioners uh, the other commissioners in. Um, so. Uh, Yen, I wonder, Yen, if you, you have a, a question about the Charities Commission yeah. um, and other commissioners, if you can, if you have any questions, if you could let Adele have them and she'll make sure that they, they come through to uh, to me. And Olivia, Olivier, feel free to, to grab my attention if you wish to, to add anything else. So, uh, Yen. Um, yeah, thanks, Abdul. Um, just a quick um, thought as well, you know, it's really, you know, it's really kind of, you know, uh, struck me this idea of kind of begging, you know, this kind of asking, this kind of, this way of justifying the asking of these funds for the, for the causes that you're trying to address. And it makes me think that um, how, how this kind of justification process is somewhat kind of embedded in the work that you have to do, i.e. Um, applying for funding, et cetera, et cetera. So it just started making me think to another question or point that you made about the Charities Commission, which was, you know, the rules that are imposed by these governing bodies about how you can set up as a charity. How do you think that is having a direct impact on your ability to do the work? How often are you sat in your chair writing um, an application for something than doing the work directly? Absolutely. There's, there's, there's three of us in this office that spend most of their time looking at fundraising. It's simple as that. Time that we could be using to help those kids that Olivia was talking about. 
uh, or, or supporting the community language school to develop a curriculum. Yeah, we spend most of our time looking for funding because the only way that we could, I mean, we've got we've we've got buildings, we've got responsibilities, we've got staff. The only way we can keep them going because these are not mainstream. They're not like where you're in the university and you're a lecturer. You know your salary is coming anyway. We've got to look for that salary. That's why I said it's a begging ball for us because we're always begging. Yeah, and it's humiliating as well, to be honest with you. It's very humiliating having to do this. Uh, uh, because we think that the work that we're doing should be mainstreamed. It should be provision that's funded automatically. Uh, but as far as the Charity Commission is concerned and the rules, yes, you're right. There's a lot of time. We've got to comply with everything the Charity Commission has put down. Everything from audited accounts to AGMs to elections uh, uh, to f uh, fundraising to giving staff their rights. Everything mm. that's written there in the Charity Commission has to be. And that takes a lot of time mm. and effort. Too, yeah, but I think it keeps us on our toes as well to make sure that that we're that we're doing things all the time. But it is very time consuming. I agree with you completely. Yeah, because the implication there is that you know you have to do the same kind of monitoring and same kind of evaluation that a large institution Absolutely. with a larger staff team, you know, you know. I'm just thinking, how many hats do you wear in your role? And there, there is probably an answer to some of the difficulties that you might face. No, I agree with you. Uh, mm. uh, we wear so many hats. Sometimes we lose our heads. We don't yeah. even know where, where, where we are. But, but, but to be honest with you, um, uh, most of the organisations that I, that I work with uh, uh, apply every single point that the charity committee has put down they need to comply with it because they know if they don't comply with it and there's one complaint yeah your whole organization disappears because the charity commission gives you no mercy on that again that's another mm. issue because i think the charity commission should be should have more scope for supporting these organizations but they're not they just apply the rules and you've mm. got to do it and these rules are very strict how can it be more streamlined do you think how can it be more effective well, I think it becomes more effective when community organisations are properly resourced, because then right. you, you you allow people to have the time to be able to do the jobs that they have to do. <laughs> yeah, so there's a there's a basic bottom line level of absolutely. resourcing that needs yeah. to, right. Okay, got it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I might have time for for one more question from Commissioner Jonathan. Did you want to ask a question, or was that an observation? No, okay, I'm getting a wag of the finger. Um, the, I, I'm, I'm going to attribute this to you, um, Abdul. We wear so many hats, we lose our heads. Is that, is that you? Is that you? Yeah, 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 it is us, it is us. We're forced okay. to wear so many hats, not that we have to be. We're forced by the system to wear so many hats that we do lose our heads. Yes, yeah. okay, don't be surprised to see that in the report somewhere. <laughs> um, Olivier, can I just turn to you to see if you have any, any follow-up questions? Because I feel we're coming to a natural close. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Abdul, my last question to you will be a quick one. What do you think is urgently need to improve community learning? Again, I'm, uh, it's, it's so difficult to go back to this, but unless we have the correct resource base, the correct resources into the community. We're not going to achieve very much uh, than we have achieved. I mean, we're doing as much as we can in these circumstances. But unless that resource base is increased, uh, obviously we need to improve as communities in the way that we work. And we talk about this regularly, Olivia. We need to become more professionalised. We need to. But unless we get that resource, we're not going to be able to do that either. Yeah, uh, I've got 35 staff. I don't know how. I think you've got equally the same. 35 staff. I would say half of those staff need a lot of training. They, they need a lot of there's needs for resources so we can send them on training. Yeah, we can develop them as individuals who have become professionalized and able to deliver. Yeah. And unless we have that resource base, we're not going to be able to go very far, I think. Mm. Uh, last question, and this is from uh, one of the, the external watchers. Uh, this is from Malachi. Um, uh, so you've, you've mentioned a range of organizations from the 90s and people from the 90s. Is, is there anything else that you, that you haven't mentioned from the 90s that you think we're lacking now? It doesn't have to be from the 90s, but from the past, that we're yeah. lacking now. Yes, there, there, there is one thing, and I think it's, it's, it's very important to note. I know some people might not like it, but I think there's, there's a dependence on the old guard. I, I mean, I see myself as part of the old guard. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a dependence. Uh, uh, we need to get more young people uh, to be able to sacrifice their time and their, their effort. Very similar to what we did when we were young. We need to to get that balance so we can get young people to take over from people like me and Olivia and people like that. And I want to work on that. I mean, I think within the Yemeni community, to some extent, we've been quite successful. Uh, we've got a chair that that's a young, a young uh, individual, and we've got leaders of organizations that are that young people. And we've had leaders go out into the system as well. But it, we need more work on that. Yeah, we because we can we can we People like like myself don't have life with their own families because the community has taken over completely, and we want to change that. And I would like to see more young people take over the realms of, of leadership within the black community. And I, I I think we need me and Olivia and other people need to do more work uh, mm -hmm. on that. We tried with Bema COVID nineteen, and we're trying with that. The problem we're finding, and I'm going to be honest with you, is many young people keep saying to us, "What am I going to get paid?" Yeah, but well, they don't realize that we didn't get paid. Yeah, we when it was voluntary for 30 years, it was voluntary. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you were able to get a job like I've got now, and I'm very happy with the job, yeah, then it's a paid job. But you, there needs to be some sacrifice, and that's something that we need to work around. But I do think that we've got some very brilliant young people, mm -hmm. uh, some very intelligent young people. And I think it's about, uh, and if we had the resource base, I think we could do more with young people uh, to develop them. I don't know whether Olivia would agree with me, but that's my point. My point is that our time is probably over. We need to bring in young people to take charge, but we need the young people with the right mentality to think that they have to make the same sacrifices as we did to build what we've done. These things haven't come from nowhere. The mm -hmm. fact that you've got 22 community buildings in Sheffield didn't come from nowhere. The fact that you've got organizations having 35 staff didn't come from nowhere. We, we've built things like the city council. I've built the city council. Yeah, it's just that we've done it free to some extent, and that's something that needs to change for the future. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think that's a good point for us to to end on. Olivier, I'm looking for a nod from you. Um, um, Abdul, I, I look forward to, to seeing you again at the Civic Life and Communities hearing where you're talking about the BEMA uh, um, COVID-19 Action Group um, and, that, and that important work. But I'd like to thank you for your time today. It, it's been really insightful and very welcome and a great start for us today. Um, I'd also like to thank the commissioners for, for their questions and their time. Um, and, and I would like to, to bless them with five minutes or so before the next session starts as a result. So Abdul, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you very much. And commissioners, we'll begin again at 11.45. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, can I make one more point before you go? Because I think it yes. might be helpful for you. Okay. I don't I don't know whether you were able to, I mean, I mentioned this twice to you, whether you were able to get the, the investigation reports that were done on the black community in the 90s uh, from the department. There, there, was, uh, there, there, was, there, was, there was an inquiry into the Afro-Caribbean and Yemeni community in the 90s, which, which found the council to be racist at the time and in the way that it's dealt with these organizations. And it, it actually advised and recommended a way forward. I'm just wondering whether these reports might be useful for you, Chair, uh, to go uh, to uh, because it's. I know it's all ground, but I think it's important that that, that, that it's learned from. Can I just check, Abdul? Did you uh, send me the reference for those? I, I think I sent it to your officer. Uh, the reference, but they were done by the Race Equality Unit at the time. Uh, Donovan, Donovan, somebody called Donovan and another guy were heading that department. Uh, and the council spent a lot of money. They spent about £140,000 on that inquiry. Yeah. And I think it's worth looking at that report because it might feed some of the things that you, that you're, some of the recommendations might be useful for you. Thank you. I, I'll follow that. I'll follow that up. Mm. Like that's a, a useful line of inquiry. Hello, Sharon. Uh, Sharon Bell Williamson, that is. Sharon, you're 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 on mute at the moment. Hi, Sharon. Kevin Hilton here. Okay. Hi. Welcome to the second session of our education hearings for the Sheffield Race Equality Commission. Okay. You can hear us okay? I can hear you fine. I've just switched devices because one wasn't working. Ah, 
Okay, do you, do you need a minute to... to I'm get... fine, I'm fine. Let's go for it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to, to hand over to, to Adele, who's going to do a little bit of the, the, the housekeeping before she then hands over to us for our conversation. Thanks, Adele. Uh, morning, Sharon. I'm Adele Williamson and a member of the Race Equality Commission Secretariat. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about the background of the work of the Commission before we start. The Commission is an inquiry into the nature, extent, causes and impact of race inequality and racism in Sheffield. Okay. The Commission was established to focus on six key areas, health, education, civic life and communities, business and employment, crime and justice, and sport and culture. Today is the first day of the education theme. Okay. At the end, of the all of the hearings, then there will be a final report will be produced and it will be sent uh, to the key stakeholders of Sheffield for action. The, commi the Commission has asked witnesses here today, uh, of which you are one, um, to share your insights into the terms of reference and the questions in the terms of reference in the Commission. And these are um, these are sharing your knowledge of racial inequality and racism, um, which may be of use of, to the Commission. Knowledge of your own or other approaches to race equality duties and or frameworks. Mm -hmm. Any analysis of the causes of racism and racial inequality within your sector, so within education. Any examples of good practice in relation to reducing racism or racial inequality. And finally, what you believe to be the best way of reducing racism or racial inequality within the city. Okay. As a witness, you're required to act in good faith and by appearing here today, then that is what, what you're doing. And can I say that obviously um, the hearing is being recorded and it will be available um, afterwards, but only commissioners can ask you questions any papers or any non-confidential evidence will be made available on the Commission's website afterwards. And can I just make a note, obviously, for uh, commissioners to wait for an invitation from the chair uh, before speaking, and can you introduce, can commissioners introduce themselves before speaking as well? And if you've got a chat, can you, a question, can you add it into the chat function? And I'll send that over to the chair. So. Thank you very much, and I'll pass you over to Kevin uh, Hilton, the uh, chair of the commission. Uh, hello again, uh, Sharon. Uh, Welcome. Um, as independent chair of the Race Equality Commission, uh, I'm joined, as you can see all around you, by commissioners um, who will be invited uh, shortly to, uh, to, to speak with you and, and to ask you uh, questions and for you to share your experience. Um, Sharon, I wonder if you could make a, a short statement about your submission and and its and, and any of its key points that you'd like to to emphasize for us. Okay. Um, and then uh, after you've done that, if you, if you can keep it brief, because the commissioners have had the opportunity to see um, uh, evidence, um, can, commissioners will be invited to ask questions after that. Before you before you do, Sharon, do you think you could just state your name? Um, your organisation and, and the capacity in which you're, you're attending today. Okay, so my name is Sharon Bell Williamson. I'm a primary education teacher uh, working in Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. I've been a teacher for 27 years in Sheffield, across a few schools. And do you need a bit more context about the school that I'm in at the minute? You could say you could say a little bit, but really, this is it's just about a short uh, summary about the, the key points of your your submission. So, okay. if you wish to say something about the context, I'm just going to say at the minute I'm at Manor Lodge Primary School, which is a 1.5 entry school in Sheffield. Uh, we've got quite a wide catchment area because of where we're located. We have children from the Wyburn area, the Manor Park area. Um, we suffer again with social mobility because we've got pupils that are coming in and out from various countries, as well as, you know, our regular forever Manor Lodge children. At the minute, we're 40% EAL, EAL, EAL with our pupils. That's English as an additional language. 
um, and we're privileged that we've got children from this school who speak over 20 languages. Thank you. And can you can you just state what part you played in the in the submission of the evidence? In the sub what part I played? Yes. Can you just elaborate what you mean by that? Oh, sorry. Oh, did you did you write the evidence or did you write it in in collaboration with with? Oh, sorry. Um, I met with met with my ed teacher briefly, and we went over a few things that we needed to cover as a school to get you know, a good perception of where we are at Manor Lodge. And there were other parts that I wrote on a personal basis from yeah. my years of experience. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. We, we have until, until about 12.30 um, uh, today. Uh, I'd like to um, bring in uh, Dr. Sharon Curtis, if just to add an extra level of confusion. <laughs> To uh, to lead on the the questions in this session. So uh, over to you, Sharon. Okay. Thank you. Hello. It's, it's going to be a bit confusing, Sharon. I, I feel as though I'm talking. I know. To you. I think it's we nice. can cope. We'll be fine. I, know, I think we can cope. Uh, so lovely to meet you. I'm Dr. Sharon Curtis, and I've worked in education for uh, a lot of years in all kinds of aspects, and some parts in health and, and other areas. So um, thank you for your evidence that's submitted. I'm really interested. I mean, first of all, I will ask you, you said that you work with the head teacher and you uh, submitted some on a personal level. Do you, did the two things go hand in glove or were there some things that you fell away from the school that you wanted to share with the commission? Um, some things I think we did hand in hand, you know, when we talked about, you know, what's in the national curriculum and what Manor Lodge is doing at the minute. And then there were other experiences, you know, where I felt like the staff, there'd been perceptions of racial abuse and the parts about, you know, what we need to do for our children, examples of good practice. So, I mean, I said I was going to elaborate on, you know, the points that we did together, which mm -hmm. was fine which was fine by him as well. He's also had a copy, our ed teacher, Mr. Bob Cuff. He's got a copy of this. It was emailed to him. Uh, we've discussed it so he knows what's in it in the full entirety. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do you want to say a little bit in context about how it feels sort of living and working in Sheffield? Uh, maybe say one or two examples of um, what you've experienced um, it's very mixed. Um, I think living and working in Sheffield has always been a mixed um, opportunity. I know there's certain areas of Sheffield that people might think are predominantly more catering for a specific ethnicity. Um, I've had many good experiences working in Sheffield. And I think if we're talking about working as in teaching, teaching's been varied depending on the school that I have been at. I have worked in a lot of inner city schools um, and that's my personal preference and that's where I feel like sometimes you can make the most difference. But again, it's working with practitioners all over, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to say in terms of what a good experience is in terms of working with either like-minded practitioners or what are some of the issues that have been raised within the various schools that you've worked in? Okay. Um, one of the evidences that I've submitted is when I was talking about um, a staff that was uh, subjected to quite a bit of racial abuse. Um, so at a previous school, I worked with a teacher, colleague, uh, she was newly qualified, she was coming up, she was of Pakistani heritage, um, and she was re receiving a lot of racial abuse from the parents, from the children, you know, they were using the, the, the racial abuse word as a slur saying it's that teacher using you know referring to a Pakistani heritage and the children were using that in the classroom as well um, and I think on the children's part again that's the learning that they've got from home isn't it you know um, and you know one bit she came to me she said you know this is going on I could see it was happening they were bypassing her and talking to the English teaching assistants and I said well let's have a talk let's talk with the children let's get them together let's go over what we can do about this 
So, you know, we talked about our nationalities. You know, we had maps up. There were young children. Um, I believe they were six and seven years old. Um, we had a good discussion about us all being different, all having different skin tones. We talked about it. And I think as a teacher, as I've worked through the years as well, children have often come to me, whether they were lining up to show me their work and touch my skin and then touch their hands in their innocence, not knowing if the colour is going to come off. And me being me would always say, it's not come off, you know, I am brown, you can see. And that's just their innocence because they've okay. not experienced that. Um, and I think having a teacher of an Asian um, heritage as well, that was something that we wasn't used to at the school at the time. And I think in that area where we lived, if people came on the estate who were of that descent, it wouldn't be long. They didn't last in the school. You know, they were driven off by the community. They didn't feel welcome. So we had the meeting and it seemed to have gone fine and some children took it on board. And then a few little girls came up and gave her a big hug and said, we really like you, Miss such and such, even though you're, you're still our teacher. So we just know that there's still a lot to do in areas, supporting families, supporting schools, supporting staff. Sometimes our staff, I feel I work with, they're afraid to say the word black or anything. They're not sure when it's being used in a racist term. Um, and recently we did something at school where we had to wear a mask and we were doing the mask singer as one of the things before we came out of Zoom. And I'd said to my children, oh, I've taken part in that. I bet you'll not be able to guess who I am. And a voice said, oh, we will miss because you're black. The rest of the class were, oh, she said the black. Really, really upset thinking it. And I said, but I am black. I said, but if I'm wearing a mask, will you be able to tell from my eyes that I'm black? So it's experiences like that, whereas mm. children are scared to be racist from their parents. And it's the understanding that we need to keep doing to help them realise, you know, that we are similar, we are different, and to celebrate that and, you know, be tolerant. Okay, thank you. Okay. So you said in terms of your experiences over 27 years, do you feel um, teaching that you do come across more black colleagues or? I'd say there's, over the years, we are getting more black colleagues. I think when I started, there wasn't as many and it was surprised. You were, people were surprised that I was a teacher. If I ever took my class out on a school trip, and my teaching assistants have mainly been, you know, Caucasian. Um, the lead person's always gone up to them. If we take them to the cinema or various places, they'd come and say, oh, are you the class teacher, such and such? And they'd always say, no, it's Mrs. Bell Williamson there. You know, if I was tending to a child. And that's happened numerous times over the years, you know, even up to pre-lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I think as you look around, I mean, when I did my teacher training as well, many moons ago, there weren't many black people there. Uh, and I've worked in schools that I've had 95% Asian and it's mainly been the teaching assistants and others who are the, um, of that ethnic minority rather than in the teaching positions or the leadership positions. Okay. So going on a little bit of that, does the school actively engage in recruit and in recruitment drive to consider representation of the governing board? We've tried. We've tried at Manor Lodge at the minute. Our staff, I'd say we're about 20%, um, but we want to get better. I know I'm pushing to get a representation on our governing board as a person, you know, so we've got parental representation. I think for a lot of our parents, um, I don't know if it's a lack of understanding or whatever they feel to be on the school governing body, it's almost not for them at the minute. I think until they're a, little more, a lot more secure in what they understand about how our school works, because um, I've worked in schools before and if we speak to, for instance, some of the Asian or black parents, obviously they know you want the best for their child, but they don't always seek and make sure we are doing the best for their child. Do you understand? They almost mm -hmm. want yeah. us. It's almost in that pleasing role. If I said your child needed to do this because of, they would happily go, go with it, not understanding the full impacts. Wow, okay. So so still if, sorry, go on. No, I said this still work to be done. Right, okay. So if 
in particular, a staff member or yourself had um, an, in an incident within the school, how would that be dealt with in terms of a racial incident? Um, all racial incidents are, what's the word, we, all racial incidents need to be reported through the normal channels. You know, what's happening right now, that's what we do. And that's whether it's racial abuse, that's happening through the children, you know, through the staff. Um, we also will have a discussion about it um, and make sure there's a bit of consultation so people understand what's happening, how it's happened. And that's, again, when they do the governing meetings, those are noted and minuted on there as well. Okay. So you, are you aware of the numbers within the school or whether that actually happened? Um, it has happened in the past. I think over this last current years, to my knowledge, there haven't been any. Right, okay. So in particular, if we look at trends uh, that may happen within the school, can you say a little bit about um, any exclusions that happened is the particular ethnicities or gender? in relation to your experiences? I would say in previous years, I have noted there was a trend that um, without being biased, a lot of the black boys were excluded or I don't want to say looked at differently or perhaps treated a little differently because of their boisterous behavior. And because of that, you know, there, there has been exclusions um, at Manor Lodge currently, uh, that's not the case. Um, but again, we're still working on absolutely everything to make sure, you know, we follow procedure. Right, okay. So um, in terms of any training that takes place, um, do, is there an emphasis or have you ever felt an emphasis in terms of um, being race aware, in terms of anti-discrimination, practices do you feel that there's a push within the schools or the educational system I think in the educational system that's there's still work to be done there again I'm not going to say for any of this that we are here I know for myself as an EAL lead um, I've tried to make sure working together with the school that we are promoting you know everybody's ethnicity we are being aware and making Manor Lodge as multicultural as possible. We want it to be a warm, welcoming environment. I know pre-lockdown, if you walk into our school entrance, when I first started at Manor Lodge seven years ago, I had quite a few biracial girls in my class who were still drawing and colour themselves white with long hair. And I kept saying, but you don't look like that. And they're saying, I know. So I think from there, I've made sure we've got skin tone colours that children can use that children are looking in the mirror and being proud of who they are. Um, at the entrance, we've got, we all smile in the same language. That's up there. And it's got self portraits of the children showing their natural skin tones and the hair types, you know, even if they're wearing a job or not, you know, those mm -hmm. children are celebrated for what they are. Um, and I think as my role as EAL lead as well, I'm trying to promote and push and make sure we're recognizing and celebrating, you know, it's all the stereotypes as well, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Um, something my class is working with at the minute is the Lincoln School Projects. Um, and that works with, I'd done it pre-lockdown and we were able to meet uh, to neutral in neutral place in town, but we're matched up with a school in a socially, democratically different area in Sheffield. Um, and this school is based around it's, they've got quite a lot of farming children. And I think when they came and met us, because that school is predominantly white, they hadn't seen a lot of children from national, different um, backgrounds at all. And mm -hmm. that was nice. We went to a central area, the children had to draw themselves, then we folded the pictures in half and they looked at what made them same, what made them different. And, you know, it was the visuals, it was the stereotypes of, you know, hair, air, mm. eyes, etc. But then we looked at sibling groups, we looked at, you know, their interests. And a lot of children from that have realised that they are quite similar. You know, they've got three brothers and two sisters. They, mm -hmm. They've got a pet. They enjoy eating certain foods. And again, there was the differences that we talked about. You know, some of my children who 
go to a mosque, they weren't sure what the mosque was. And that was explained to them. The other children were saying, we've got 300 sheep and yet a lot of our children hadn't even got a cat or a dog. So it's breaking down those stereotypes. Um, a lot of things, you know, because with the Lincoln Project, we've also got a Zoom this afternoon and we're doing what's called a caring tree. And I've talked to my class about, you know, what are the things that you care about? And despite us looking different, you know, they were caring about the environment. They wanted the world to be more environment, environment invite, inviting for them. You know, some of them cared about de deforestation. Others were worried about their family in another country. And, you know, whether it's food or shelter or poverty, there's still things that, you know, these children have got the similarities about. And I feel like if we touch it at the primary stage and we break mm -hmm. down those barriers and the stereotypes, you know, we're going to build a better society. We're going to have uh, better relations in Sheffield. Children won't be growing up being ignorant or not knowing about, you know, why people look different, mm -hmm. et cetera. Okay, thank you. I just wondered again a little bit about your own self or other colleagues that you might have in terms of um, black teachers and promotion. So I don't know in terms of the promotional aspect about um, from teacher up to head teacher, um, how easy or difficult or, or your thoughts on that? Can you, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Curtis, can you be a bit more specific? I can. Um, I just wondered in terms of your own personal promotion, um, do you feel that, that it's been an easy journey to if you wanted to go to a different position? Hmm. Uh, yes and no. I have previously been an assist assistant ed teacher at school um, and it was difficult at first getting in that role. Again, once I was in the role, you know, I enjoyed it for the time that I did it. But I think for me personally, I enjoy being with the children. I enjoy being in the classroom. And I think when I was in more of a leadership role, I mean, at the minute I am key stage two, you know, the phase lead for our year 314. Um, I prefer personally to be in the classroom. I think having done both, you know, I'm blessed I've got the qualities and I, I'm glad I can do that. But being in the class with the children and working with them at their level, that's where I want to be. That's what I enjoy doing personally. But again, for other colleagues as well, I think sometimes, yes, there is barrier. There are barriers there. It's not as easy. It's not as accepting. And maybe I do feel like if someone's got to do five hurdles to get to that stage, if you are black, that you're doing a lot more hurdles. I know of colleagues who have perhaps had a bit more coaching to get to those leadership roles because they've had friends who are in those positions and that's just my personal experience. Mm. No, thank you. Uh, sorry, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Curtis, can I just follow that up? So, you can. So, uh, so Sharon, um, when you say coaching, do you mean that, that informal inside, those informal insider conversations that people have because they are part of a, you know, uh, a, um, a colleagues network or a friend friendship group. I think that's what I'm saying. Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Curtis. Go back to me. Right. Do you want? Um, I'm really interested in terms of um, inclusive practice and what you would give as an example uh, within the school about how inclusion um, is actually demonstrated or used within my. Okay, I'm going to have a look at some of my notes that I've made. No problem. Um, to make it inclusive. Yeah, so mm -hmm. how do you, yeah, include? I think as Manor Lodge, as a school Manor Lodge, in terms of the curriculum and our children as well, I think, let's get myself sorted. Um, we're trying to make it as inclusive as possible by looking at our curriculum, um, not just, and I know a lot of people through Black Lives Matter and the other agendas that have come up recently, that mm. a lot of my colleagues who are not in education are expecting things to change just overnight. 
And I think we need to realise that, you know, it's not about um, a personal school going on that journey because we still have to follow the national curriculum. And I think in the evidence that I submitted, I put a quote from the national curriculum, which, do you want me to read that and go over that? Or? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. If you could share that, because other people watching All right. okay. um, wouldn't, wouldn't have seen it yet. Pardon? Yes, other people watching wouldn't have wouldn't have seen it yet. So yes, you can read from that. Okay. So what I said, the national curriculum, there are statutory reports that we need to follow in key stage in key stage two history. And it mentions that pupils should continue to develop a chronologically secure knowledge and understanding of British, local, and world history, establishing a clear narrative within and across the periods they study. They should note connections, contrasts, and trends over time and develop the appropriate use of historical terms. They should regularly address and sometimes devise historically valid questions about change, cause, similarities, and differences and the significance that they have. They should construct informed responses that involve thoughtful selection of and our organizations store and move relevant historical information. They should understand our knowledge of the past and this is constructed from a range of sources. So I think in everything that we're teaching mm. um, in the education system, we know a lot, a lot of it needs to be changed. A lot of it needs to be current. And, you know, history is history, but we still need to make sure that we are teaching the true part of history. We need mm -hmm. to make sure that children are given the full narrative of what's happened. You know, in my evidence as well, I've submitted something about one of the topics that we do in year three, four, and that's with our 79 year old children is made in Sheffield. And I've done that a few times. And I think the first time I did it, we had a look at which children were made in Sheffield. If you were born in Sheffield, and there was a third of my class that weren't born in Sheffield. Mm. We again looked at, you know, what Sheffield's famous for, which is brilliant. You know, we know about the steel industries. We visited Kellam Island and everything else. Um, and we read a book by uh, Teresa Tomlinson, which is a time slip book that goes back. And Meadowall, as we know it, um, used to be called Adfields, is where the steel works used to be. So at the minute, we've got the steel men outside there mm -hmm. and we've got the women of steel. So we've learned about all those things. But again, I'm looking at my parents who worked in the steel industries. I'm looking at some of the elders that I know and respect who worked in the same industry. And as I, you know, we went to visit the statues, we talked about it, we read the stories about them. And I said, you know, where's the black representative there? If we're going to tell the children that, you know, Sheffield was built up by certain ways, you know, we've got other people that came across and supported with that, you know, our elders, we need to just make sure that we're giving a true narrative mm. and teaching children that, you know, lots of things have happened and lots of people contributed and let them understand what it is. You know, one of the things I've always said in teaching, you know, if our children see it, they can be it. And I always look at when I was in school, you know, I didn't see any black teachers, black teaching assistants or any, you know, everybody who presented in front of me and did a good job, obviously, if I'm here, you know, were white colleagues. And it's mm -hmm. nice that I go in there and they said, it's nice to have a black teacher, miss, isn't it? And I said, yes, it's not just pushing our children on to be, you know, the sports and the music, music, mm -hmm. because, you know, that's what we are good at. You know, we can aspire to a lot more. It's fabulous, thank you. Very thorough. Yeah. You just indulge me as chair. Um, uh, so, sorry, Dr. Curtis. So, Sharon, <laughs> uh, um, you, 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 you took, you've talked about your maid in, in Sheffield and some of the questions that you would naturally ask about, you know, about your own family, your, your own background, and, and, and so on. Um, it, it, if, if these questions are not ingrained in the national curriculum, in, in what is, is naturally taught in the school, if you're not there or somebody who's like you isn't there, then what are the chances of, that, of those questions being reproduced in, in schools that lack diversity? They're not. 
I don't think there's any chance. I, unless people are looking, researching, unless it's in the history books that we're presenting before our children, you know, there's almost zero chance. Mm. I think we're talking from a narrative that, you know, our parents have told us and what we understand that's happened. And, you know, it's our history. Mm. If it's not there and you're not there, you haven't lived it, you don't understand it, it's harder to teach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr Curtis? I'm really um, interested to know, A, what sort of support do you feel that you would need in terms of being a black teacher in Sheffield and whether you're aware of any networks that would give you that support? Um, I'm not aware of too many networks that will give me that support. I know there are various groups that um, now support each other on Zoom, which is a very good experience where people are sharing practice as in teaching I know a few years ago there was the diverse leaders course mm -hmm. um, and I took part in that and that was a wonderful experience and I've known people from that to move on and get jobs in leadership positions so yes do, do we know who ran that course uh, that was run at the time by Dina Martin oh right yeah yeah, yeah, Dina, yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Curtis, I, I'm conscious that there are a, a, a few questions. From yeah, that's fine. The other commissioners. Yeah. Do you want to ask another question before I bring them in or? Um, no, actually, I think I just about got to the end of that. So thank you, Sharon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if I can call on Malcolm Cumberbatch to, um, yeah, if you could just uh, introduce yourself and your question, that would be fantastic. Right. Um... I'm Malcolm Cameratch, uh, one of the commissioners. I've got a long, long history in education. Um, the, only, the only thing I haven't taught is young kids. <laughs> I've, I've taught from 15 up to like 92 or something in <laughs> age. <laughs> so um, I, I'm very keen to, to know um, what are the Ofsted reports like? Is it going, are they going in the right direction? And a second um, um, point on that is, do they report any issues about race, ethnicity or language? I think the Ofsted reports need to give a true picture of where the schools are. So yes, they will report on race, ethnicity and language and our environment, inviting the school is and whether children in different um, children are reaching their targets. And I think for myself as well as a school, what I meant to say, we do a performance management, you know, you get two different performance management meetings per year. And what we do at Manor Lodge, and you know, some of the schools might do this as well. We also look at class groups to make sure that we are looking at the different groups within the classroom to make sure that they are making progress at their, you know, in whatever area. I know I've got a copy of a class action plan here. And, you know, we've got the different groups, whether children's might be boys, girls, preschool meals, whether they've been forever manor lodge, which means that we've nurtured them from nursery till when they've left, or if they've joined us at different parts within the school year, you know, whether they've come to us in year four or year five, etc. cetera. Um, and from that, you know, when we have our review meetings, you know, I can look at, you know, my black girls and my Asian girls in my class and I can be looking, see if those groups are making enough progress in all the subjects. If they don't, again, you look at the interventions that we can put in place to raise, you know, the expectations and raise their attainment. That might be a booster group. It might be an intervention group going out with a teaching assistant. It might be through quality teaching. And I might say, well, I'm going to target this group for this term and make sure I give them more support with their grammar, their writing, their times tables. So again, that is something that a lot of schools do, but I know Manilosh School does that well. Right, that, that's, is that under your own initiative, your own steam or driven by an Ofsted report? From Previous. I believe it's driven by Ofsted's and schools that are good schools. Um, this will be good practice to do. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, 
uh, Malcolm. Thank uh, you. Aaron. Uh, Yen, can I ask you, uh, invite you to ask your question, if you could just introduce yourself before your question. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is uh, Yen Fong Ling. I'm an artist and senior lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University. Hi, Sharon. Uh, Hi. My question is just a question that kind of links back to the sort of first session. I was curious as to what relationship you have with community organisations with regards to kind of, you know, education and learning after schools, that kind of stuff. And is this actively encouraged within schools, do you think? Um, at the minute, I would say we haven't got enough links with community organisations. That is something that we do need to work on at Manor Lodge School. Um, again, we've got a diverse community, but a lot of our children, I don't want to say go their separate ways when they leave the school. So that is something that we do need to build up, yes. Do you know of previous examples of where those community links have happened or? Um, some of the community links probably happen, for instance, we've got a one voice singing um, mm -hmm. choir that we're doing at the minute and that's across a lot of schools in Sheffield. And we've done that in previous years. So we're learning the same songs together. We used to go and sing down at the arena and do activities together. Um, so that's one example. At the minute we are singing and we will meet together, meet via Zoom to do that. Mm -hmm. um, again, the Lincoln School project, I think that's been one of our most successful ones that we're doing at the minute. But it's getting parents, isn't it? In, I think when we've done topics linked to food as well, it's getting those parents in to share, you know, what different cultures eat. And so our children aren't just saying, eh, I don't like that, which is sometimes what they naturally do. And I say, but have you tried it? Do you understand what it is? Mm. And then they go, oh, it's not bad, actually, miss, is it? So again, it's just building it and making links. But we do need to work a lot with yeah. outside communities. Mm. And I think and after you COVID and lockdown, we will try. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you, do you see a particular role for, for these types of community organisations? What, what can they do that you might have the limitations to do within your role? I think the children are more relaxed after school. I think it's, um, again, building community relationships, which is always a good thing. Breaking down stereotypes, raising cultural awareness. Um, bring building a more tolerant, united city. And I think if we can do it in the primary age, I know a lot of people think it isn't important, they're only young, but a lot of my children, as I tell them things in the classroom when we discuss it together, they say, oh, I went home and told that to my nan, she didn't understand. And I think, you know, that's what we've got to do at this age, make sure we're training up these children to understand so they can make that difference as they grow up. Um, Great, thank Sharon. you. Yeah, okay. thank you very much for that, Sharon. Um, I, I, I have a number of questions um, which I would love to ask, um, but because of time, I'm unable to. So if, if I could just ask you to, to sum up what, you, um, what your expectations are for us, for the, for, the, for the Race Equality Commission, and what you hope the legacy of the Commission, um, what you hope the legacy of the Commission uh, to be? Yes, I, will. Um, I think across Sheffield there's so much that needs to be done. I know things are in place and we're trying to keep doing various things to build up community relationships. I think it's working together, being inclusive in everything that we do. Um, So what can what can the the the, the committee can, to to facilitate that to be as a to be a catalyst for? Don't worry. If you, yeah, I can't worry. answer all of it right now, obviously, but it's doing what we're doing, but making sure we are making those links and building it together, making sure we're in schools, um, pressing so we can get the education system somewhat changed to include everything, um, making Sheffield as welcoming as possible. I know there's still areas within Sheffield that aren't as welcoming, 
there's still areas that are noticeable, perhaps as it belongs to this community or another one. You know, as I said, you know, even air products, cards, culture, literature, we've got to make sure that's all relevant to all our pupils in Sheffield. Sharon, we really appreciate your time today. It's been absolutely fantastic, really, really helpful. And thanks for the evidence uh, that you and uh, Mr. Cuff um, mm -hmm. produced for us. Um, we, we, we're drawing very, we're moving very quickly to, to 12.30. So I think this might be a time to thank you for your time and to thank the commissioners for their time and their, and their questions. And we hope that you can stay in dialogue with us. Um, and, and if you'd like to get back in touch with us in regards to anything, in regards to, in relation to our terms, terms of reference, please do. If we can help with anything, please, please get in touch. Um, so, so thank you again, and please thank the school. Uh, commissioners, if you can just take a, a few minutes uh, comfort break and we will just hold uh, a second before we, we bring our next uh, head teacher in, Adele. Hello, Cam, Kevin Hilton here. Hi. Hi, how are you? All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us this lunchtime. It is nearly lunchtime, isn't it? Yes, it is lunchtime. Um, I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Adele Robinson, uh, who leads the Secretariat, who's going to do a little bit of housekeeping before she hands back to us for our, our conversation. Um, Adele. Okay, hello. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about the context of the work of the Commission and take you through some of the kind of rules. Okay. Um, the Commission is an inquiry into the nature extent causes an impact of race inequality and racism in Sheffield. Uh, the Commission focuses on six main themes, health, education, civic life and communities, business and employment, crime and justice and sport and culture. Today is, is the first day of the education hearing. At the end of all of the hearings, there'll be a final report and that will be submitted to the key stakeholders in Sheffield for action. Uh, the commissioners welcome witnesses here today to share your insights into um, the terms of reference for the inquiry and share your understanding and knowledge of the following five areas. The first is racial inequality and racism in Sheffield, which may be of use to the commission. Knowledge of, uh, of your own or other approaches to race related duties and frameworks. Any analysis of the causes of racism and racial inequality within your sector. Any examples of good practice in relation to reducing racism or racial inequality. And finally, what you believe would be the best way to tackle racism and racial inequality within the city. As a witness, you're required to act in good faith and by appearing here today, then that's what you, that's what we take to you doing. Um, please note that the hearing is being recorded and it will be on, it will be available afterwards, but only commissioners here can ask you questions. Any papers or non-confidential evidence that you've submitted will be made available on the Commission's website afterwards. Can I also note that for those in attendance, uh, can you wait to, for the chair to ask you to speak and can all commissioners introduce yourself before speaking? And if you've got any questions, please use the chat function and I'll send those on to the chair. And now I'll hand you back to Professor Kevin Hilton, the chair of the commission. Thank you. Hello, Cam, another formal welcome. Um, as independent chair of the, uh, the Race Equality Commission, I'm joined by uh, commissioners from the Education Working Group and, and others who, are, who sit on the commission. Um, in, in a moment, I wonder if you could if you could make a just a short statement, uh, just introducing your uh, your evidence um, and some of the main points around around your uh, your evidence. Um, after after that, the uh, the commissioners will be invited to uh, to ask questions. Um, 
Um, but before you before you do that, do you, do you think you could uh, just introduce your, yourself and your organisation and the capacity in which you're attending today? And and also, um, um, if you could just state what part you played in the submission of the evidence. OK, so. Um... I, I, well, I wrote the evidence, so I, I wrote that paper um, and um, in, in a matter of two days, I wasn't quite sure what you wanted. I wasn't quite sure whether or not I'd been invited to the hearing due to my own ethnicity or whether I'd been invited to the hearing due to the context of the school. So uh, I'll talk briefly about me and then I'll talk about my school. Okay, so... Um, I started teaching in Sheffield in 1992. I started as a maths teacher and uh, I've gone through in the paper that I've presented uh, my career journey. And I started teaching at a time when I felt that actually they, there appeared to be more diversity in schools in the school that I first started teaching, where EAL in particular, uh, I think it was at the point that there was quite a lot of migration into the city and EAL was being funded uh, by the local authority in a way that it's not currently funded. And what that meant was that there, there, there was this recruitment drive to, to have targeted teams of people uh, in schools and the school where I started my teaching profession, I very much saw more diversity than I do now. So I, I wasn't employed as an EAL teacher, I was employed as a mathematics teacher. And, uh, and then um, over the years, uh, that career journey has taken me out of schools to work across uh, a whole range of schools and then back into schools at a senior level. And I've, 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 I've been successful in terms of promotion uh, and I've worked in very very different contexts so I have worked for 10 years I worked in the north of the city as a senior leader which was predominantly uh, um, uh, black minority ethnic children over 90 percent of the children were um, from an Islamic background uh, a very tough school uh, but highly successful uh, as well um, and then from that school I did go and teach in Derbyshire as a head teacher that was my first headship but that was mostly white so it is a very different context and I and, and I think in hindsight I think I wanted to test myself and I wanted to test myself in so much that I wanted to know whether my successes had been due to my ethnicity in a largely black minority ethnic school or whether they were just successes in their own right. And actually what I discovered in my first headship where I was surrounded by the, well, I was the only uh, black uh, ethnic minority person in the school that actually I was, I was highly successful there. And from that context, I've now moved to my current school, which is in the Southwest of the city. Um, it is in the most, um, well, it's, it's, in, it's in part of the city which is most affluent, which is the southwest, but we're on the edge of it. So we, we, we actually have a, a massive catchment area and it is mostly white. Uh, so I've given you an overview of our context. So we are, uh, with our sixth form included, I believe that we are the biggest school in Sheffield. Um, so it's a great privilege to be the head teacher in a very large, predominantly white uh, school. Uh, but our um, cohort, in our BAME cohort is, has increasingly, it is increasingly growing. And it's, that's as a result of um, social housing being available in this part of the city. So unlike other Southwest schools, my school, our school, uh, geographically is nearest the most deprived area uh, that it serves, the most deprived community that it serves. Um, and whereas the other Southwest schools, they are in leafy suburbs, but they do have a deprived catchment, but it tends to be 
the furthest away from the school. So it's quite unique in that way. So the, the school itself, um, I joined three years ago. Uh, no, none of those three years have been the same. Um, and I joined thinking I could make a real difference because when I joined the school, the, the biggest priority for the school was the outcomes for the most, um, for the children that were coming from the, the most disadvantaged cohorts. They were not performing um, at, at, uh, at an acceptable level. Uh, and they were, there's a massive gap between the disadvantaged children and the non-disadvantaged children. And because of where I'd come from, which was in Derbyshire, and the school in Derbyshire was white, it was over 60% pupil premium. And I, I'd taken that school from almost being inadequate to good, and with it, you know, there was this real self-belief that it didn't matter where you came from, uh, whatever your background, that you could achieve. So I knew that I was going to bring that that whole mentality, that and 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 that mindset, and I was I was very confident. And I'm, that's our school bell. I was very confident and still confident that we would be able to do that. So in a very short space of time, at the end of my first year here, we saw a significant increase in the outcomes for, for uh, our disadvantaged cohort. Now, the vast majority of Bain children that join Meadowhead are, um, well, half of the percent, half of them, or roughly half of them are from a disadvantaged background. On entry, their, their profile is just slightly lower than than uh, the white children who joined the school, but actually their progress is much better than the white children. So over time, the progress of our um, cohorts here, the black minority ethnic children is actually, is good. It's, it's, it is good progress that they make. So what we have now found is, however, whilst we made a significant improvement in a very short space of time, that now, post-COVID, some of those gaps have, 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 have widened again. So we've got another job on our hands. So it's, it's a really interesting school. Um, the profile of our Black minority ethnic children are uh, such that they're not overrepresented in a negative way on any any data analysis that we do. Um, high, good good relationships with with parents. We've got. Um, I've also put in my paper some recent work that we have. Um, done with our students we have a Meadowhead against racism group which okay. is uh, a student leadership group um, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you um uh because i have a i have a commissioner jonathan williams who i have tasked with leading the questions on this you, you you don't you don't really need to to say much more about your your evidence because the commissioners have had had sight of, of your evidence. So we're, we're hoping that we can drill down into, um, uh, into some of the issues, in, including the group that you were just about to, to, to tell us about. So, so we'll, we'll keep everyone in suspense about, uh, about that work. Um, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to bring Jonathan Williams in, if, if that's okay with you, Cam, uh, just to lead um, with, some, uh, with some questions. But Jonathan, if you could just introduce yourself uh, before you uh, proceed with your questions, that, that would be fantastic. Oh, and also just to remind everyone that we that we are looking at this. Uh, this session is is timetabled for about forty five minutes, so we're, we're you know we'll, we'll try to keep our our questions uh, and responses where possible as as uh, concise and succinct as possible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Cam. Um, yes, I'm Jonathan Williams. I have got experience in sort of your catchment area 20, 20 years ago, I was a worker working with the kids that was at risk of exclusion and was attending in that area that was 20 years ago. So a lot has changed. Uh, my background is working in education and inclusion. 
um, and, you know, doing a lot of work around that. So, yeah, I've got a number of questions that in relation to sort of your paper that you submitted. Um, the first question is sort of relation to your sort of part of your journey. Um, in the 1990s, when you began teaching, you, you struggled to see anybody of, um, who looked like you in schools. Now, why did you say um, it was refreshing not to be the only Bay member of colour? Well, when I, when I did my teacher training, it, uh, you see, I grew up, I, I was born and grew up in, um, in, in the West Midlands where there was much more diversity to, to when I came to Sheffield, it, mm. it was, it, it appeared to be very white, but, but what I didn't know at that time was that most of the migrant families had settled to the north of the city. And it wasn't a place that I would have visited as, as a student because you, you, you're mostly central. Yeah. But when I started teaching um, and, and I did a couple of teaching placements, the placements were far and wide. So a couple of those placements I'd gone to Barnsley uh, and, you know, and genuinely the children had never ever met an Asian person. And, and, and they were asking me questions like, well, when I told them I, I, I was from an Indian background, the only person they could relate that to was to red Indians on TV. So they would ask me what my name meant and things like that. So there was naturally quite a lot of interest. So, and, and very, very white. I mean, some of these mining towns where I went to, very, very white. So my first, uh, my, my last teaching placement where I got my uh, first teaching post, however, it was refreshing to see much more diversity. And that's where, uh, in that, and that was in Sheffield, where there was uh, um, both um, Bain teachers, uh, across the academic curriculum, but also support staff supporting EAL learners. And it was at the time when I think the Mali children were moving, Somali families were moving into Sheffield and the local authority had invested in, 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 in quite considerably in EAL support. I don't know if that answers. It was, okay. it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was, yeah. it was I, I wasn't this kind of, attraction as I was in 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 um, in Barnsley when I'd, I'd been to do my teaching practice I, I felt that I you know that yeah that I fitted in sort of thing and and there wasn't as much attention to my ethnicity as it had been in in those other schools that yeah. I'd been to yeah yeah this next question is into sort of in relation to you sort of career progression into leadership um was it was it was it pure coincidence that the only head teacher of color saw your potential when they appointed you as a senior leader or do you feel that uh, there's any there's another theory behind that i think that there was something in that um i i as an advisor i went to lots of different schools um um and doing whole school health staff um cpd for uh for secondary school teachers um and the um the head teacher that gave me my first opportunity he clearly did see that potential and i think i i i, I god i find that really hard to answer but i think there may be something in that i think at that time when i joined um about I think 2002 I joined a senior leadership team there was a black head highly successful charismatic at soup he was one of those super heads at that time and that time was being used quite a lot of really high profile within the local authority um, but I joined an all-male senior team and every other member other than the head and myself were white, they were white. Um, but I think it might have something to do with that. I think he thought that in that community, which was mostly at the time Pakistani, that I, I would, my ethnicity would 
would help. But he did have a word with me to say that whilst my ethnicity may assist me, that my gender may not. And he did have that open and frank conversation. But as it, as it turned out, it, it didn't hold me back in any way. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Um, now, this is sort of a question when you moved into sort of into Derbyshire. Can you clarify why you felt governors in a predominantly white school wouldn't risk taking you on as a BAME head teacher? I, it wasn't just that, because I, I, I had applied, I'd applied to, uh, I, I'd applied for a headship in the real outskirts of Sheffield. There's a, there's a school right at in Stocksbridge, it was a while ago. Um, that was where I applied first, and it it was um, it was a quite an insular community, very white community, and um, I, I, I felt although it was never ever discussed my ethnicity, I felt that my ethnicity was a barrier there, and that wasn't probably the only reason why I didn't succeed in that application. But when I went to Chesterfield, I could see, you know, the community it served. When I drove, because I, I drove around the catchment area and I could see a very white, deprived community, you know, Union Jacks out the window. Um, it was, you know, I think historically workless families. Um, and I could sense that there would be uh, um, some um, maybe uh, tensions, maybe uh, uh, some hesitation in appointing as a, as, 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 a, as a head teacher, somebody that governors could possibly, I, I thought that governors may think that I would find, find it really difficult either me to connect with that community or for them to connect with me. Because there was this, yeah. I felt that there was a substantial amount of work. Well, everybody knew there was a, 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 an enormous amount of work to be done in that school. And I, I did think, and I, I did think that it would be a risk because if I hadn't made that connection, um, that it could go sort of, you know, not the way that it did, but there was a risk with that. Um, and it was largely about, it was, it was to do with racism. Um, and, and, but I, and there was some racism that I experienced over the six years I was there. Uh, and on one case, it was quite extreme, but, you know, I'm, and it never stopped me in terms of my work that I needed to do there. And the staff were, and the governors were wholly supportive. Uh, and they, I don't think mm. they ever saw, they, they never ever saw my ethnicity as a barrier to, to any, 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 any success there, uh, potential success. Yeah, okay. Now, so how, how does this and your other experiences equate to the notion that because you have succeeded, there isn't a barrier to success regarding re ethnicity. Um, you use the term glass ceiling to donate the common reference mm. to ethnic barriers. I think um, when I was in my, um, when I worked in the north of Sheffield where it's predominantly male, uh, it's predominantly uh, black minority ethnic children. Um, there were definitely glass ceilings, but not glass ceilings that the school had put in place, but cultural issues there. And uh, I, I was quite instrumental in, in trying to, to, to work with families to, 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 to convince them of the, the value of education for their children, especially girls in particular. Um, so there were some challenges there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I've asked our, and regularly I meet with our, our BAME children um, and 
the, the Bain children at Meadowhead are, are, are quite different to the Bain children that, that they appear to be quite different to the ones that were at Fervale. What, what was always the case at Fervale was they had really high aspirations. They didn't, they didn't believe that, um, they didn't believe, they, they had high aspirations, but in, in some cases, they were held back due to some, com some cultural issues, and that was mostly girls. Um, but their, their, their entry levels to the school were low. And the, the barriers that we had were to develop literacy at a fast pace, and that was actually stopping them from succeeding. Uh, but over time, they made good progress. And, and, and it's really, I was really proud to be on the senior team when we got the outstanding judgment from Ofsted. But in terms of how they related to me, I think they saw me as a, as white children, I think saw me as a, um, I, I broke the stereotypes of the perceptions of what uh, a, an Indian person would look like uh, and what they would expect from uh, um, from somebody of that background. But in terms of my, the, the children here, well, I've asked them the question, do they feel, do they feel better provided for because their head teacher is from a Bain background? They, they think, and the answer has been that they feel that I would understand their issues if they had issues to do with racism better, but they've never, they don't feel that other teachers don't provide for them equally as well. So they don't, they don't make the distinction between me and a white teacher. Uh, they feel that all teachers treat them well. Uh, um, and I haven't had, um, any child report to me, and I think they would, that they felt that their teachers had treated them unfairly due to their colour here. They haven't said that here. Mm. I don't okay. know if that answered your question. I've forgotten your question that you asked me, Jonathan. I'm sorry. Was, yeah, the question was in relation to sort of the notion that sort of you've succeeded. Uh, and is this sort of, um, does this barrier to success due to ethnicity because of your success? I think it definitely gives children the, the, the confidence to, in terms of their own abilities. I think it's good to see uh, in, in positions of authority in, in prominent positions, both in schools and on the, on the media, but you know, seeing uh, our politicians, uh, uh, people from a Bain background, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that that is, is, yeah. is ever going to be a positive thing. Uh, those positive role models, mm. all, all children need positive role models. Uh, I met with a child um, not so long ago, and he was talking to me about his primary experience. And, 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 and it was at that point he realised he was different. And what was really upsetting for him, that although he was coming from a primary school, which was um, almost half black minority ethnic and white, every literature that they had only had two black faces. You know, and it's that kind of thing that was upsetting for him. And it didn't reflect it didn't reflect the community. The school's literature didn't come reflect this, this, the, the community it served. And, and, and they couldn't yeah. see why that was the case. Um, but I think it's only, it's also, only if, very... If I can just... Sorry, I was just... Sorry. Can I just... just yeah, sorry, I was gonna... Can I just draw your attention to the, the time? So we have about 15 minutes. So you yep. need to be quite strategic in the... Oh, gosh. That you... Yeah. Okay. So you'll need to be quite strategic. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, right. I'll speed. I'll. I'll speed it up then. Okay. 
Right. So I'm 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 going to start asking questions now to, in relation to Meadowhead, head because you've you discussed you've touched on your school. So how, how how do you feel that ethnic ethnic representation has changed at Meadowhead, where you have sort of four out of 193 um, staff that are BAME? It, it is worrying. It is worrying. You know, I've just gone through, um, there's been a high staff turnover since I arrived. Uh, and with any new head, you know, you take that opportunity. And some people, um, you know, had, well, listened to what I had to say and made a, made a move elsewhere. Um, but in all of the recruitment that I have done, I have had very few Bain um, candidates, applicants. They, they've just, I've just not had them. I mean, I've just run, you know, this time of the year is quite quite busy in terms of recruitment processes. I've done English teachers, uh, science teachers, maths teachers, not one Bain candidate has come forward. Uh, um, it, you know, we've shortlisted everybody uh, um, that we needed to, but even with the ones that we didn't shortlist, um, we didn't have any applications. Uh, I think what, what we find is that the, the BAME applications are usually uh, applications from abroad. So it makes it very difficult to shortlist them because um, because on pay, um, in terms of their qualifications, in terms of their um, them meeting the person spec, they, they don't tend to do that. So uh, we're not getting uh, enough uh, BAME um, in, uh, applications um, at the moment. And, it, and, and, in terms of, and in terms of the BAME staff that you have beside yourself, where they're located in terms of the hierarchy, in terms of uh, the hierarchy within school, what okay. roles? So I've got, um, they are all classroom teachers. Okay. Female classroom okay. teachers. So there's three women, uh, history, maths, ICT, and then there's myself. Now, in terms of your teaching staff, how confident do you feel that the expectation of your teachers of BME pupils, um, how do you think they're high enough to meet the pupils' capabilities? Well, um, the children say that um, they feel that they're being stretched and challenged. The progress data in terms of outcomes suggest that they are. They make they make better progress than the, the white children at Meadowhead. Um, their, their profile on entry is largely um, in line with the, the white children, slightly lower. Um, so attainment is slightly lower, but progress over time is uh, significantly above the national average. So I think over time they do they do make good progress, yes. And and are there any cultural sensitivity issues um, that affect sort of the racial disparities in the school? I, I suppose it would impact, um, that are impacted by these um, racial disparities. Well, I, we have, we have lots of different ethnicities. So unlike some of the other Southwest schools, where there is a big cohort of a particular group, ethnic group. We don't have that. We have lots of different ones. Um, so, um, mm. I, you know, we have two children, I think in the whole of the school, bearing in mind there's 1800 children, uh, roughly about two or three girls that wear a headscarf and they're confident in wearing a headscarf. Uh, and they tell me that, that you know, they haven't, um, um, they haven't received any uh, 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 racist comments about that. We have children that uh, are, are proud of their um, their, their religion uh, their, their, and they're of uh, Islamic faith. Not a problem. The only time that uh, um, a, a group of children came to see me uh, was in my first year here. And we, they were studying of mice and men in English. And as a result of that, she overheard 
children using the N-word in a social context. And, and she, she came to see me. And as a result, we went into every class to make it clear that that was not acceptable. And that wasn't, you know, just because they were reading it in the English lessons, it doesn't mean that that, that, that that racial slur was an acceptable word that they could be using in any other context. But we've actually moved on from that and children have given their feedback as to how we, they want us to deal with that. And actually it's got to the stage now where we're thinking that perhaps there are other texts that are better to, 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 to yeah. study uh, at, at GCSE than that mm. particular one. Yeah, because I've got it. Um, why do you think it was necessary for the school to change its approach to the use of oppressive language like sort of the n-word in mice and men and also of lord of the flies um, because you know we anticipated that this text has been taught for a number of years until the student students intervention that was taking the children's lead actually they 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 didn't not want us to, they didn't, it's one of the set texts on the exam board, so it's not something that we have much choice about, but they didn't want teachers saying the n-word, uh, and, 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 um, and that was the feedback that the children gave us. It, 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 previously, it was, it's always, it has always been discussed at the start of the book that, that at the times that, that that word is going to be used. And it's always been um, dealt with. Um, however, I don't believe that previously we'd asked the children how they felt about it. Because actually, because we're in a predominantly white school, when you are the one or, or there's two black children, it actually makes them feel very uncomfortable and perhaps if 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 it was a larger cohort of black children in the classroom as it was when I was at Fervale it never ever you know it, it I, I don't believe at that school it would became a, 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 as big of an issue as it was here uh, because those the children here because they're in a very small minority it makes them feel really vulnerable. Uh, and and, and that, yeah. that was the lead that we took from the children. So we have a different policy in school when we read those texts now. Jonathan, yeah. may, may I interrupt? But, so, Jonathan, may I interrupt? Yeah. Just, Cam, can I just check? Does that mean that at Fervale they have continued to read out the N-word in Lord of the Flies? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I left a number of years ago I, I, and I don't even know if they study the text. So at the time that I left, they were studying the text. And at that point, I do believe that the English department at that point were reading out the N word. Uh -huh. uh, but um, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, some schools have sort of racial literacy as a concern um, when there's sort of racial disparities in school. Is this something that's been discussed in your school? So an example, um, could it be the, the way that Agard's poetry was presented in the class of the English lesson without any sort of context of black cultural reflection of this? Mm. I think there is still further work to be done there. Uh, and um, diversity across the curriculum and you know it's not enough just to celebrate difference when it's um, Black History Month and what they're saying is you know that what we're all looking at now is um, taking lots of opportunity right away right all the way through the uh, curriculum to look at where diversity uh, where there isn't that uh, diversity in terms of literature, in terms of uh, black history, in terms of uh, positive uh, role models uh, um, um, and celebrating uh, um, the successes of uh, scientists, mathematicians from a black 
background, all of that, you know, needs to be done in a, in a, in a more coherent way. Um, so um, there is there is always um, there has been actually there has been recently more on the back of uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. There has been more uh, focus in schools because actually at this at the at this present time, most schools in primary and secondary are revising the curriculum and, and, and really thinking hard as to how to develop that cultural capital, uh, but also to give that, develop that holistic, ensuring that we are preparing our children for life in modern Britain uh, in a better way than yeah. we have done previously. That is a, a real priority um, um, yeah. for, well, for most yeah. schools, I believe. And, and, and sort of how are these issues reflected in representative representation uh, in representative governance uh, because you say that this is slow progress um, in terms of the governing board where you have two um, BME governors well um, they understand they might, we have a very supportive a very strong governing body actually um, and they do understand um, they do understand um, the, the, the development uh, and the requirements uh, that are that are needed uh, in the curriculum quite interestingly our um, our school improvement partner somebody who comes into the school on a termly basis who's also uh, a HMI inspector is 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 a is a black woman who who works with me and 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 she works very closely with the school. Uh, so um, and, and in terms of um, the, um, the and, and gives us a guide as to in, as to whether or not we're on the right track and also is the person that supports the governors in terms of. Um, head teacher performance management and also in terms of conducting those monitoring visits. So she's that, she is that, that she has that objective view of the school uh, and that yeah. also helps the governors in terms of their, the, the, the information that they need, that need in terms of the evaluations of the school's work as well. So that's, that's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could, could you tell us a bit about the Meadowhead Against Racism? Jonathan, I mean, yeah, I, this last one. I love, yeah, I love, I love where this is this is going. I'm I'm just going to ask you to try to 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 bring it together, um, and bring it to okay. a close, you know, through the, at the end of this theme, if that's okay. Okay, All right, no thanks. problem. Yeah, I would, could you sort of tell us a bit about the Meadowhead um, Against Racism group? Okay, so um, at the end of my first year here. Um, a black family came to see me uh, and the um, one of the children was um, in her year 11 it was just as she was leaving and she gave me the perspective of uh, of a black child being in a predominantly white school um, and she said that she was keen um, to make a positive change and she was due, she was going to join this sixth form as well. It was also the year where we had a, uh, a, a very, very uh, highly successful uh, child, young black boy who had been, he was dual heritage, uh, white uh, and black, and he was walking uh, in the neighbourhood, uh, coming back from football practice or something quite uh, innocent. And he was, um, by two police officers, he had been, um, there'd been an, uh, a, a message over the radio that there'd been a burglary in the, air, burglary in the area. And he was um, 
all of a sudden manhandled, the police car stopped near him and he was put in the back of this car. And, and it was really difficult dealing with that. And, and it affected him immensely in, in terms of his mental health. And I met with his mom, his mom was white, he is white. Uh, and, and she talked about how he'd been treated by the police. And there was a, a big, big inquiry over the way that he'd been treated, but it was incredibly difficult for him. And he was, you know, he successfully completed his A-levels uh, and, and went on to university. But all of that sort of highlighted the inequalities that still existed whilst children have repeatedly told me, and we have regular meetings with our children about, uh, with our BAME children and, uh, uh, and Cooper Premium, different cohorts of children in terms of gathering student voice, they have repeatedly told me that they, they feel treated, well treated by, by, by teachers, by staff, uh, and they don't feel that they're, they're they, 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 they they are being uh, treated, uh, that they, the racism, I've, I've, I've gone out to ask them, have you, have you been subject to any racism in school? They've said no. However, they do tell me that in different parts of the city that do feel vulnerable when they're out and about um, and that they have been subject to, to, to uh, uh, racism uh, and, and name calling when they're out and about in schools, um, they feel that um, it is dealt with. They've given us some feedback as to how better to deal with uh, certain situations, and we've listened to that. Uh, and we do, um, uh, there is a hard line um, that we uh, have in terms of racism in school. What we're finding is that as children, it's very much with the younger years that we have, we see race, we deal with racist incidents, less so amongst peers at key stage four in years 10 and year 11 or sixth form, but in year seven in particular, uh, this last year has been uh, an issue. There's been a number of cases. What I've also witnessed recently, which is very concerning, um, I have recently um, excluded a, a white child um, and um, her father, I had a conversation with over the phone and he felt that I had treated her unfairly because of the color of her skin. And he said to me repeatedly in that conversation, it was a very long conversation, that had, that ch had his daughter not been, uh, had his daughter been Muslim or black that I would not have excluded her and he said that repeatedly he told me um, that he was going to um, if I didn't change that exclusion that he was going to protest outside of my school and at the school gates he was going to put up union jacks that's what he said to me and it, it was a very long and very difficult conversation but I had to reassure him that her ethnicity did not have any bearing on my decision making. So I am fully aware that there are pockets still within the community where there are tensions in terms of community tensions. But I think what the, the, this whole agenda in terms of uh, race equality, in terms of Black Lives Matter movement, what it is creating is uh, a vulnerability amongst white community, uh, and, okay. and, and 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 clearly that there is a, a vulnerability there, which is poses a risk, poses a risk mm. in terms of victimisation. So, so where you've discussed Jonathan, sort of Jonathan, sorry, can I? Could you make okay. this your your last question, please? Yeah, this will. I'll make this the last question. So. Um, where you've discussed the need to challenge racist behaviour at a point of offence, how is this reflected in Meadowhead policy? Um, well, 
Um, it is about the child, if the child believes that uh, they have been victim of racism, then we will always investigate that. Um, and at times, um, it's as a result of um, perceptions and it's, a, it's ignorance on the, on the part of the aggressor. And that, that, needs, that needs dealing with. At times, there's a sanction that is involved. Other times, it's about bringing in parents and, and, and discussing the issues and, and also trying to put things right through a restorative way. Um, what children are, have often said is some of, the, some of the conversations that were being had with those aggressors uh, were away from, um, were away, were just, they weren't in, in front of them and they needed to know what was being said. So we need to be better at sharing that information. I have, you know, there have been times when I've had long letters from white children who felt that there was an injustice uh, of, um, you know, uh, 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 one of their black friends had been treated unfairly. Uh, and and I've, I've responded to that as well. So what, what our Metahead Against Racism group were very keen on, whilst the vast majority of children there were from a black minority ethnic background, uh, they wanted white children, they didn't want us to stop white children from joining that group. And, and, we, and mm. we didn't do that. They didn't want to be just a black group, they wanted a mix. And, and collectively they wanted us to deal with uh, um, yeah. Uh, developing diversity and equality across the school mm -hmm. uh, and, and and that was a really positive uh, thing I felt yeah and and anything in relation to policy in relation to that that school have got a particular policy around um, uh, racism, I mean, policy? we do what most most schools do in terms of you know any analysis that we do uh, uh, we make sure uh, any policy that we have, we, we will look to see whether or not any new initiative, whether it's going to disadvantage any particular group in our school. So there is that kind of assessment. Our policy is that, you know, um, that with any kind of uh, data we collect, uh, whether it's behavior data, exclusion data, whether it is, um, you know, I've done a fantastic diamond award ceremony this morning, which uh, is the highest reward there's children with the highest reward points and what was very clear to, to me was that there were Bain children there being represented so uh, you know with any kind of um, activity whether it's extracurricular whether it is intervention whether it is um, a take-up of, of school trips I will always ensure that there is full representation there of the community that it reflects the community that we serve whether it is BAME or whether it is disadvantage uh, and, and, and and that's something that is high on our agenda because actually we've had to close gaps and and we are having to close gaps and whilst the BAME community hasn't been um, overrepresented in a negative way it isn't something that as the group is growing there is there's always a vulnerability there that it could it, it could be uh, that it, it is um, you know that we lose our eye of, on the ball in, in terms of their outcomes and their progress and their well-being in school as well. So it, it's it's here you know it is high on everybody's agenda. The policy is that we continue to analyse everything that we do with the different groups, the vulnerable groups. And I do see, whilst our progress data didn't suggest that it's a vulnerable group, it continues to be a vulnerable group because it's in a minority in our school. Uh, Jonathan Cam, um, it's been an intriguing and and, uh, and very kind of thought provoking session. Um, believe it or not, it, it's 1.30. Um, and we, we've gone a little a little bit longer than than timetable, but I felt it necessary to to allow you to to both speak and uh, and to to continue to educate 
um, throughout the whole session. So, Cam, uh, thank you very much for uh, for attending today. I hope you can stay in touch with the the Race Equality Commission. Um, and if you and if you feel that you need to touch base with us, with me at any point, please feel free to do so. Um, and uh, Jonathan, thanks very much for for leading the, the the questions today and for the commissioners for your additional questions, which I know populated the the chats. Um, but given the, the 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 time, we couldn't get to to some of them. Um, but back to you, Cam. Thank you very much for your evidence and for being a witness today. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to to, to speaking with you another time in perhaps a, a less formal uh, setting. Hello, Angela. Hello. Hi there. Hello, Angela. You can hear me, that's good, thank you. Angela, are you going to be operating with any video today? Um, I've tried, right, there oh, we go. There I are. did that a minute ago and it said the host had prevented my video, which I didn't know you could do. <laughs> no, neither did we. <laughs> yes. Not till this morning, so we've had a bit of fun with that. I, I apologise for being late. I've had to. I've done it twice because sometimes the um, sound doesn't work. Well, it's it's great to see you, Angela. Uh, my name is Kevin Hilton. I'll be chairing the session today. Um, before we get into our conversation, um, I'd like to just hand you back to Adele Robinson, who who's leading the secretariat for the Race Equality uh, Commission. Adele. Good afternoon, Angela. I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the background and just a few of the rules and then I'll pass you back to uh, the chair. Um, so the commission itself, as you know, is an inquiry into the nature, extent, causes and impact of racial inequality and racism in Sheffield. It focuses on six key themes, health, education, civic life and communities, business and employment, crime and justice and sport and culture. And today's hearing is the first hearing on education. At the end of all of the hearings, there'll be a final report, which will have um, some actions for key stakeholders within the city. Uh, the commission has invited key witnesses and you are one today to share your insights into the five key areas of the commission. And those areas are Racial inequality and racism in Sheffield, anything that you can say which is of use, that you believe to be of use to the Commission. Any knowledge of your work or other approaches to race related duties and frameworks. Any analysis of the causes of racism or racial inequality within your sector. Examples of good practice in relation to reducing racism and racial inequality and anything that you believe to be the best way to tackle racism and racial inequality within the city. Any witnesses are required to act in good faith and by appearing here today, we believe that that is so. Only those in attendance can ask questions, commissioners in attendance, uh, and any papers that you've submitted, any non-confidential non evidence will be put on the website afterwards. Um, all commissioners, please, can you wait for the chair to invite you to speak and can you also introduce yourself before speaking and can you use the chat function to ask any questions and I'll pass those over to the chair. So today, Angela, I'd like to pass you back to the chair, Professor Kevin Hilton. Thank you very much. Hello again, Angela, and uh, welcome. Um, as you can see around you, I'm, I'm joined by uh, commissioners um from the education working group and and others that, who sit on the race equality uh, commission um i'll be inviting them to to speak with you shortly um but before i before i do i wonder if you could just make a short statement about your your submission uh, and its key points um, but before you do that, if you could just just state your name and, you, and your organisation and the capacity um, in which you're attending today, that, that would be fantastic. Um, and if you were involved in the writing of the evidence, could you just let us know that as well? Of course. Um, so, so I'm Angela Fouts. I'm the Chief Executive and Principal of the Sheffield College. Um, I had oversight of the production of our documents 
uh, my colleague, the Vice Principal for Student Experience, collated our submission. Um, and I think my um, summary statement, my sort of oversight of that would be that what, what we tried to evidence was the work that we have done over the past three years to understand our environment at the Sheffield College well and to promote equality and to work hard to um, build a, a sense of citizenship across the organisation, both the staff and students. Thank you. The uh, the uh, commissioners have sight of your of your submission, um, so so thank you very much for for getting that that to us. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Sonia Gale to um, to lead on um, questions with you. Um, a conversation with you, um, Sonia. Can I just just ask you to introduce yourself? Um, before you ask your first question. Thank you, Professor Hilton, and uh, welcome, Angela. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so just by way of background, my name is Sonia, Sonia Gale. Um, I'm an experienced non-exec and committee chair and executive director, and, and my specialism is board governance, social inclusion, strategy, and risk management. Um, I currently sit on the boards of Breast Cancer Now UK, uh, and Steel City School Sheffield. And I'm also a mentor and coach for Women on Boards UK. Um, in terms of my background, I was previously a financial services director at HSBC, Barclays and, and other financial institutions. Um, I was a management consultant for Andersons and Ernst Young. And I was previously also a policy advisor for the financial services regulator. Um, I'm a chartered banker, an MBA graduate, and a fellow of the International Compliance Association. And uh, when I get some spare time, I also uh, support the British Red Cross and Sheffield NHS Hospitals Foundation Trust. Um, in terms of um, my background in the context of Sheffield, I was born in Sheffield, in Pittsmoor. Um, my parents uh, were part of the Windrush generation. My dad was a steel worker. My mum was a kitchen assistant at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, and I left Sheffield in the 80s to go and work in London. I've traveled internationally, lived in various places. And um, I recently returned to Sheffield permanently in 2020. And I've noticed just how much has changed. And yet, I guess in other areas, it seems to have either stood still or, or even worse, deteriorated. So um, that was really the driver for my role um, today supporting the Sheffield Race Equality Commission. I think I'll stop there. Uh, Sonia, could you proceed with your questions? Thank you. So, um, Angela, again, thank you, um, um, you know, for joining us today. And we're very grateful um, to Sheffield City College for sharing its time, uh, sharing your time and sharing its evidence, which um, we received recently and, and I have now reviewed. Um, I also uh, took the liberty of actually looking at some of the information publicly available on the college's website, uh, particularly around your EDI report and, uh, and the equality uh, document. I think based on these information sources, um, I've put together a number of questions. Um, I appreciate we're running maybe 10 minutes behind, so um, we'll try and whiz through these very quickly. And if I could ask my fellow commissioners just to feed any insights or questions you might have directly to Professor Hilton, and I'll try and leave a good 10, maybe 15 minutes at the end where we can cover these off in Q and A's with Angela at the end. Uh, so if you're comfortable with that approach, Angela, are you happy that I go straight into the questions? Yeah, yeah, that's fine, absolutely fine. Thank you. So um, in no particular order, uh, just to get your views around, I guess the college's strategy and progress around increasing um, diversity amongst the academic staff. And I think this was something that your chair of governors uh, mentioned in your EDI report, um, where he commented on the disparity between the staff representation um, as measured against the student body. So I'd really like to get your thoughts on what the college is doing to reduce this disparity and does it have a target delivery date and some insights around success measures. Yeah, so, so what, what, we've, what we have is we have a disparity at leadership level 
and a disparity in our academic staff between our kind of student cohort and our, our um, staff cohort in general. And having identified that when, when I began my work at the college, what we've been doing to, to, to kind of address that is, we, so we work with some of our national bodies and quite a lot of the national bodies in education, so the Education Training Foundation, the Association of Colleges, the, the, you know, there's a clear focus at the moment on um, building diversity into governing bodies, because our governing body isn't very diverse either, um, lead and leadership, but less so at teacher level. So, so we're working with national organisations to promote that um, and build strategies around diversity for leadership and governance. Um, in terms of the leadership activities, we've got some specific um, collective work around aspiring leaders from minority ethnic backgrounds. And that's about peer, peer support, peer review, networking, building the right skills. It's not accredited, it's experiential. And it's led by a group of chief exec and principals who know that we have talent in our, in our organizations but that talent is often less inclined to apply, less inclined to look upwards. So we're actively um, spending time mentoring, coaching and developing um, aspiring leaders. And that's, that's from a diverse range of backgrounds, but particularly um, minority ethnic or people of colour. And in the teaching staff, so we've been working quite hard. This, this I think, I, you know, I would freely admit this is a, a very long term piece of work and so what, what we've got is a several strands. We have a, a strand in terms of teacher recruitment from graduates. We have an intern strand, which is very, very fledgling. And then we have um, a much broader part of our people recruitment strand, which is about positive recruitment. Um, and the way that where we advertise, the way that we advertise, the things that we uh, present when we advertise a vacancy. I don't think um, prior to the last year or two have been particularly encouraging or inclusive. It's, it's been a question of we, we recruited to a post as opposed to we are particularly looking for and we're overtly stating that we are looking for people from diverse backgrounds. So we've changed some of our rhetoric, we've changed some of our approach, we changed where we advertise. Um, and we're also, we've been working in partnership with, with organisations. So from a governance point of view, for example, we're, see, we're working with women on boards um, and, and looking for partners to work with who have better experience than us and who could actually uh, recommend, uh, recommend ways for us to do this, but also might already have talent that we might talk to that might be interested in us. Um, I think one of the key things we identified was how it's about perception. So what kind of an organisation do people think the Sheffield College is? And is it the organisation for them? And, and I think, you know, you, you can't come at that in one direction. So, so if you're trying to attract me, how would you present that? And that might be very different for, you know, from attracting the next person that you talk to. And I, I think that for a long time, the Sheffield College has taken a one size fits all to recruitment. Which, which I think is a mistake because people are multifaceted and, and very different. So, so we're looking to diversify how we talk to people, where we talk to people, you know, so that we can attract a broader range of people who think that the Sheffield College is genuinely for them. And, and just picking up on some of those uh, themes, Angela, I guess, you know, just based on my own experience, you know, the first thing I would always do, and, and again, when I'm on women on boards, is we go and we look at the board. Uh, because if you see people who look like you, then you think, well, that that might be a place where I would feel comfortable. So I guess when you look at the current board and the structure, um, and uh, I understand that you're looking at refreshing the board, um, is there a strategy in place to, you know, to change the diversity and improve the diversity of the board? Because I think that in turn may will have a positive effect on your ability to recruit at the management and at the teacher level as well. Yeah, and, and I, I think the same applies to our, um, our most senior leadership, our two tiers of senior leadership as well. Um, so, so we have some, with some vacancies on the board. In terms of refreshing the board, board it's, it's, it, 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 every year there's one or two vacancies, which is really useful. Um, you know, you need consistency, but it's useful to be able to refresh. Um, what I would say is the board is in general not very diverse at the college at the moment. It has been more diverse 
in the last five years, but it isn't at the moment. So, so we're deliberately working on this. What I'm finding um, interesting about this is that uh, we've tried various ways of, of networking to recruit or advertising to recruit. And most recently we used um, the government governance recruitment service. And we are just aren't getting applications that are diverse. So there is something about pro it, it, it's very similar to teaching. You know, it, it's kind of how do you how do you get the market to 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 work for you as well? So somewhere there is a there is a gap. There's a misalignment by, by between. So my my ambition, my passion to have a diverse board that is more representative of the college per se, and people inclined to be board members. It, it's and, and a lot of the boards I'm on are lacking in diversity. You know, most of them are really not very dark. And that's in the NHS, it's, it's schools, it's um, local authority type boards. They're really not very diverse. So there doesn't seem to be an appetite to do this. Or I would suggest but that that's my experience of applications. There isn't an appetite. So some of the work we're doing uh, in the FE sector is about engendering the appetite is kind of you know why do people think the FE sector is not for them you know what why did why, why is it not as diverse on boards and in leadership teams um what, what is it about the FE sector that is not particularly palatable at the moment or where people don't see themselves as part of the governance or the leadership of, of a, a large inner city college um, and I think that's a, that's a key piece of work that that needs a lot of time and energy uh, you okay. know, it's, it's that two-way street. Um, yeah. Can, can yeah. I interject? <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. I feel like Eric Morecambe then. Um, <laughs> for those who can remember. Um, the you, you talked about the government governance recruitment service and, the, you know, the need to, to see it so you can be it, which is something that, you know, some teachers have already uh, uh, talked about today. If we were to go to the Governance Recruitment Service website, then none of them would look like most of the commissioners here. They themselves lack diversity. So, so there, there, is, there is some interesting work um, that's been done at the moment about those kind of uh, talent scouts, those, those talent recruiters, because if they themselves lack diversity, then devolving the role of recruitment to them is kind of kicking the can down the road because the problem still yeah. remains. So I would invite anyone to, to have a look at the, the website. There's no obvious ethnic diversity, I, I hasten to add, on their on their website. But it's, you know, it's just a point to just I wanted to to add in yeah. Sonia. Um, no, I think the point is is well made and and I know certainly in the private sector, um, you know, again, this was historically a challenge there, but um, certainly in financial services, and this may be, um, you know, a budgetary issue, and of course, costs are always very important. Uh, but there are now specialist headhunters. You've got Green, Green Park. There's Orderless. Uh, you know, there, there's quite a few of them, well established, um, who are very uh, focused in in this market, in in basically supporting and enhancing board diversity, whether it's by gender, ethnicity, um, or by one of the uh, other protector characteristics. There are. Um, agencies out there who can support organizations including further education and if cost isn't an issue and and you're struggling with the other avenues that might be something Angela to to take back to the board mm. yeah thank you um, um, can I just talk about um, so I was looking at your gender pay gap reporting um, just going slightly left field and I wondered whether um, you capture data on whether this provides a breakdown on ethnicity, because I, I know some firms are now voluntarily reporting their ethnicity pay gap, not just gender. And I, uh, is this something that Sheffield College is advancing? Is, I don't know, actually. Uh, in terms of, I don't think we'll be doing that this year, but then I think that's a developmental thing rather than an actual thing. So, so I so, so just to contextualise, the journey of the college for the last three years has been one of rapid improvement, and that's across not just teaching and learning quality, that's the entirety of modernising the organisation. So, so, so when I arrived at the college, which would be four years in September, you know, the, the concept of producing the annual equality statements 
was nobody had a clue. And, and you know, so, so so I think in the next academic year, we'll be able to get to that piece of work because we've got much better systems to be able to do that. You know, so, so I spent my first two years wondering how on earth we could understand the problems we had if we couldn't collect information effectively, which we are now doing, which, you know, so so it's a kind of not yet. It's a not yet in the short answer. Okay. I think what, what, what I have learned, though, this is, this is something that I have learned. So, so over the last um, couple of years, I've been able to access information in the college much more readily. What I know is that we are increasingly recruiting at the moment. We've had a, um, some, inc some really good improvements in recruitment of um, diverse, you know, of, of ethnic minority staff, more diverse cohort. They are younger and they are um, in different types of jobs. So we have... Um, so, so they may not be teachers right now, but they're coming through in curriculum support or student support or pastoral support, those kinds of roles. So the conversation that we've had um, in our leadership team is very much about how do you provide career progression opportunities for those people, for those younger people who are coming in at what in teaching terms is a bit of an entry level job before you become a teacher, perhaps. They haven't aspired to be teachers yet. And we can we, we can provide professional development for them to become qualified teachers on, on the job. You know, we, we can do that through apprenticeships or through formal PGCE type routes. How do you do that? And in a really interesting conversation with our trade union colleagues who are fantastic at this kind of stuff, um, we, we agreed that what we would do is some very specific um, I'm a bit reluctant to say this because it's it's not about talent, but it's the equivalent of a kind of talent pool. It's not necessarily about talent, you know, though, because I think talent is a bit of a nefarious way of describing it. But it's a very deliberate piece of work around people in, in a, a, a level of job and moving them to a different level of job. So growing your own and as part of that, doing some reverse mentoring. So where we've got some some people in our organisation who are incredibly good at the role they do enabling people from across the college at different levels or in different roles to understand what those other roles are so that, pro that progression and promotion is a real opportunity for them. So, so to some extent, we're putting quite a lot of energy into looking internally at the moment, you know, and, and energy into external, but we, we've got some really good opportunities and some incredible people coming through. They're just not necessarily coming through into leadership or into to sort of established teaching posts which is quite an interesting shift for us. Yes, and I think that's the, that's the area that um, a lot of organizations are looking to focus on. I think there's a recognition that at the junior level, um, that, that talent stream is, is oncoming, but it's actually when, when positions arise at more senior levels, uh, for whatever reason, um, we're not getting that diverse application, whether it's promotion from within or bringing talent in from outside and the talent is is there so as you said it's okay. you know we need to identify what that gap is what are these barriers that are actually that you can't get these people in you know in front of your um, um hiring panel yeah yeah um can we talk about the um the students i guess and and i guess looking at sheffield college and its bread and butter um uh, and the student population as your clientele and there's been a lot of focus on, on attainment. And, and I think that was brought into sharp focus by the um, Office for Students and, uh, and their survey report, which highlighted um, some quite worrying discrepancies around the attainment gap between um, different ethnic groups. And um, I noticed in your um, EDI report um, that for Sheffield College, attainment has improved. And, and in fact, actually, you, I think you state that BAME students are outperforming non-BAME students. Um, and I just wanted to get a sense for what do you think is actually driving this? And I guess within the BAME category, are there any outliers? Because I, I couldn't tell if this was overall or skewed by certain ethnic groups. Yeah, so, so, the, so our student population, um, it's shifted over the last three years a little bit. So, so the kind of general percentages haven't. So, so the you know our kind of 50-50 makeup of male to female ish, it's 49-51. It doesn't change very much. 
um, in general, we're fairly static, but what has changed is where the programmes, the programme types that people undertake. So we're reporting this year, no significant and nothing in particular from an attainment gap by the end of this year that we would be concerned about. So most of everything is, is closed and um, is looking good. But what that, that's at college level. But what that, yes. that looks different at um, uh, academy. So that's our kind of um, departments, our academy level or at programme level. It does look different. And we have a, um, so in our adult population, for example, 50% of our adult work is um, English for speakers for the languages. And that's an incredibly successful area of work for us. It's outstanding, you know, 98% success rates year on year on year, that, that kind of thing. And so you see a huge skew in, in your college attainment data um, in terms of, of that, that volume of students doing incredibly well does skew some of the areas of work at level two, level three for adults. Um, and you can't really see it as easily. 16 to 19 is a little bit easier, but we have um, some very stereotypical recruitment processes. So for example, um, we would see in our construction and engineering team that um, uh, ethnic minority students are outperforming level two white working class males. And that there is a minority of female students in that area, a, a significant minority. And there's a bit of me going and nobody's really very surprised by that. It's increasing numbers of female students, for example, but nobody in, in particular is going to be surprised by that and that's some of the, the work that we have to do to change the way things things are in and that's not necessarily a college thing I mean most of the colleges I've worked in have had a similar profile what we tend to find is that we have exceptionally high performance um, from our ethnic minority students in our sixth form in our health and science aspect in business in digital um, we have fewer enrolments to our um, service industries, protective services. Uh, it's, it's a fairly traditional kind of, you know, if you did the numbers, it's fairly traditional. Um, we tend to see the lower attainment. It's not low anymore, but it is lower um, in heritage. And the higher achievements in um, Asian descent is roughly how it works through. It's, it's nothing, so, you know, so I've been doing working in inner city colleges for, for the best part of 30 years. And, and it still doesn't surprise me that, uh, you know, it's, it's degrees of separation rather than big, big shifts, yeah. which is, is kind of faintly irritating. But when you're working in a college where the attainment rates are high and the, there really aren't any particular gaps, it is at least not not a disastrous moment. It's just a very traditional, you know. Yes. And, and there's something that doesn't feel quite right about that. And it is the same for gender as as it is for for um, race. Well, just picking up on on just drilling down into the the figures. I mean, as you said, at further education level, it looks broadly comparable. But then you see the shift as you get as you say into higher education and the attainment gap then gets much bigger. And I noticed in the data in uh, page 78 of your EDI uh, report um, that you were able to successfully close the gap in 2018-19 um, um, by four percentage points from 16 percentage points, but then it's jumped back again to 17 percentage points. So I guess, is there a story here about why the trends are going up and down is that to do with the teaching cohort or the mix of students so, so our higher education provision is is uh, we're, we're a very small provider so so we have about four four fifty students a year we, we're a tiny provider and the biggest cohort we have is in our creative arts so it's performance theater um music tech that kind of thing it's followed by health and what's been happening over the last three years is we've closed some programmes, we've seen some programmes through that we won't continue with. We've, so in modernising the curriculum, what, what we're seeing is um, a variety of things happening. So, so we're getting a different cohort of enrollees and we're seeing some tail off 
said some things that that are that that higher level students just wouldn't benefit from in terms of a career. Yeah. So so that's a kind of um, a city region generated piece of work. And some of what you can see is how is what's happened because you have legacy. The technicalities of it are the legacy bits. Yes. So it's students that you have um, enrolled and they're in their third year. And what's happening is whether or not you're retaining some of those students. So so um, the cohort that you describe, how best to explain. <laughs> so, so they came to us for the first year and rather than stay with us for the second year, they chose to go somewhere else through persuasive. Tension rate and a high pass rate. So we have an anomalous moment, which was very irritating. Um, and, and if, if I, I, I do think though that our, our um, higher education level studies is still quite traditional. It is still quite traditionally kind of organized around um, healthcare professions are popular um, and the creative part of our curriculum doesn't tend to have as many, as many diverse um, you know, as many ethnic minority students in as the health and science. So our dentistry um, work is incredibly popular. You know, there's some really uh, sort of it, it's higher level scientific uh, subjects where we don't, we, you know, we wouldn't have to promote to, to recruit diversely. And then other areas where we would, you know, and, and some of that is just, I, I have a, a very personal thought on this which would be some of this is about um, how we develop aspiration across our city and how we talk to first generation level four students who don't go to university because we aren't a university and we're okay with that you know you can still study at that level but how do you get that aspiration built in and through from a younger age for, so that you know anybody believes that they could go past level two GCSEs past level three A levels or BTECs and beyond and it doesn't have to be in subjects that at the moment, you, you know, you, you feel like almost you can rely on having a diverse crowd of students. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that it's, it's not quite right, you know. No, and, and, and I'm just interested, just picking up on that theme. I mean, um, I mean, traditionally, I, it's interesting that you refer to healthcare. Are, are you starting to see uh, demand coming through from um, diverse student populations in respect of the STEM subjects, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Are, are you seeing a diverse representation in those subjects, or is it still quite skewed? So, so, so it's it's not it's not as. Um, I wish it was that cohesive. I, honestly, I really do because that would be fab. So, what what we've got more so at the college is um, healthcare pathways, so radiography, physiotherapy but not particularly in science. So in our science programs, we have um, some applied science, but we have things like dentistry. But, but I would say engineering, not so much. Digital, not so much, tends to be dominated by uh, males and predominantly white males. Uh, maths, we, we don't do a great deal of maths because we're, not, we're, we're technical, vocational rather than applied. So maths tends to be embedded rather than, apart from A-level maths it tends to be to be um, uh, embedded. But I, I would say at the moment, some of our stronger, uh, the aspects of our work that, is, that are better at, at attracting a nursing midwifery, radiography, that kind of thing, um, and some of our science pathways. And then business, business, um, which includes things like accounting, marketing, yeah. uh, human resources, you know. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, uh, so we've talked about the attainment gap and um, just talking about your, um, I was interested to see that the Sheffield College um, had achieved the Investors in Diversity kite mark. And, and I know that there are a number of various measures of, um, of standards that, that health higher education organizations are adopting. And I know some have actually opted for the race equality charter from by advance HE. So I was just wondering um, whether uh, Sheffield College was just going to adopt the kite mark or whether you were looking to also adopt the race equality charter as well as. 
in the first instance, what we're actually doing, so, so we're all, we're in, the answer at the moment is that's not the first thing we're going to do in terms of where our energies are at the moment. So that's not a no, it's a not yet. And the reason it's a not yet is because we're very heavily involved in working with the Association of Colleges on their um, EDI charter. So, so I, and what I don't want to do is, is lots of charters that don't take us anywhere. Um, so what we've been doing, I'm just, I'm just trying to think through how's the best. Um, so we've been working with the National Centre for Diversity. I didn't mention at the beginning that I'm a patron of the National Centre for Diversity. I've been for, for quite a while. And so we've been working on with them on investors in diversity, and work, which we achieved last year. And this year we're working on leaders in diversity. But the thing that, that that's not about the kite mark, part of what that was, and it's a, conversa it's a question in the chat, that was about our culture. So, so if I if I can just pray see this a little bit. So I worked until I moved to South, to South Yorkshire. I worked for an awfully long time in London, and my last job in London was in North London. And when I moved to South Yorkshire to work in colleges, I was startled by the lack of diversity because my my sort of working life had been very rich in diversity. And then I moved to South Yorkshire and went, "There's something kind of off about this, and I can't put my finger on it." And a few weeks later, I went, "Hang on a minute." <laughs> this is nothing like the colleges I've been working in previously. And the thing that I've been quite intent upon for the last three and a half years is we have needed a cultural shift in the college in general, but more specifically, we've needed to, uh, to, be, to, to really embed inclusivity. So this isn't talking about it. This, so so, that, so I, I think a kite mark is good, is good for the um, it's good encouragement, but what we've really needed and that there are progression, promotion and opportunities in the college for everyone and anyone, um, that we have a sense of inclusivity and equality. And some of the things that we, we've been doing, so we've we adopted in, investors in diversity because it helps us to frame what the work that we wanted to do. And leaders in diversity has taken that a step forward. And, and some of the interesting work that we, you know, I, I, what I thought really needed to happen was a, a fierce conversation about unconscious bias. I mean, there's conscious bias and that, that to some extent, you know, you, you with courage and, and, and some good and some good solid work, you can challenge that. You know, you can really get in the face of that. But unconscious bias, we, we're working hard on at the moment because, and a lot of good conversations have come out of the, the training and awareness raising we've been doing on that. So, that, you know, there's no excuse. And, and but you've got to have those conversations. Um, and I think that there's, there's, a, there's an element of this where we, so the AOC are developing their charter and the majority of our students are FE. So of our kind of between 14 and 16,000 students. The majority of them fall under that auspice. So they, they, you know, there's only 400 students this year that fall under HE. And but at some point, the race equality charter, the advanced HE, the work on that, we will of course do because I'm committed to it. But I'm trying to stage things so that we're seeing an impact. What I'm after is seeing impact of the work we're doing. Um, I think there's there's some interesting things to, to be said about trying to change culture and practice. Um, so, so, for example, you know, I made a, a very ridiculous assumption that we would celebrate um, other, other cultures. When I say other, I, I don't know what I thought I meant by that when I said it when I first arrived at the college. And I thought that we would be inclusive and, you know, we wouldn't just wish everybody a happy Christmas. We'd go beyond that into other faith, religion and belief and how foolish and naive was I. You know, but, but from a North London college perspective, this was usual. Um, uh, what, what I can say is the shift and change in our practices over the last two years has been, it's been really, you know, that is, there's a lot of change and, but I still think we have a lot to do. You know, yeah. I, I genuinely believe we have a lot to do, but it, in my opinion, even, I, you know, even when I'm being critical, I think we've done a lot and I think we've improved a lot, but I can still see where we need to, to kind of keep, keep working and keep working hard for that matter. Um, Good. Well, I'm reassured really by that, that the kite mark isn't your, isn't where you're going to stop and it's very much your foundation which the college is looking to build on. So at some stage, there yeah. will, you envisage progress towards the advanced HE as part of... 
what I say as well is, I don't know if this is, you know, hopefully relevant, but we, you know, we have a college level um, improvement plan around equality and diversity and inclusion. And, but the next stage of that more recently, so, so we've, we adopted a student first approach to the college when I arrived because I wanted people to talk about students. It's what we do, you know, it's, it's our core business. But more recently, because that, that's a lot more embedded, the conversations we've been having recently is it, with all of our department leads is how can you make a difference to equality, diversity and inclusion? And they are absolutely fascinating conversations. So asking people as part of their working day to identify two or three things they can really make a difference to, they can really impact on. And, and one of the things that comes out of those conversations is people go for really big things. They go for quite big, bold statements about how they're mm. going to transform things. But when you actually say, yeah, but what are you going to do? When you actually get into the kind of real detail of that, people are very unsure about what, small things they could do to make a difference yeah you know to, to really start to embed better practice better aspiration and to be more inclusive and it's those small incremental changes that I'm more interested in as yeah. opposed to a big bold statement that no one acts on and who are your um EDI champions I mean are they a pretty diverse bunch more so more so in the last 18 months which is is um, it's been really interesting. We we've we struggled to put our um, our corporate board together in a, in as diverse a way as we would have wanted to. But what we found was when we opened up the debate to let's get some stuff done, let's have some task and finish groups or some focus groups. Oh, we got a real richness from that. So our our actual champions, our change agents, are really diverse. And what we're trying to do is persuade those people, some of those people. To get more involved in the corporate strategic aspects of things because again it's that reluctance to kind of sort of put themselves forward and that's all aspects of diversity you know it's not specific to race yeah and um i, I was just reading through through the evidence i didn't see any specific mention and obviously it talks about engagement with the student body um but i guess it would be interesting to know whether um, how you gather feedback from your students on their perspective on Sheffield College. Is it an inclusive environment? Do they feel that they've got safe spaces to talk about race? I mean, what are your EDI champions sort of teasing out of out of your major clients? So, so we, we do um, three times a year, we, we do a, a whole college student survey and there, there are, I mean, it's like my face then, and we, we have, we have, standard questions that we can benchmark across the sector, which is you do out well of the back of that. So, so a, a big college global survey is useful, it's interesting, you find things out, but actually what, what we do next is we take the areas where we're a little bit, well, what does that really mean? And we go out with more directive questions and, and probe with three or four questions that open that conversation out a little bit. Um, so, so we've got that's our kind of standard format for getting information. We've also the student union, which is not it's not like a university student union, but it's it's blossoming and it's blossoming beautifully and is is very diverse, which is great news. We've champ we've asked them to champion kind of leading us through the student body. So, so what groups do the student body want to set up so they can talk to each other, to the student union executive, to people like me. You know, yes. can I get invited along to listen to what's going on and to ask questions? And I'm really used to doing that, um, you know, and I've done that in, in many of the colleges I've worked in. And at the Sheffield College, we just get the, the legs are just there for this. And this is the bit of my, I love this bit of my job, you know, getting to talk to people and find out what they really think so that we can really make changes is something that I, you know, I really value that. And um, so we're just on the cusp of that bit. And I think the other thing that I'd say about that is, um, we. This is just a, a sort of a bit of an outsider. Uh, you know, I'm sort of standing back a little bit from some of this. I think the thing that we've done this year. So I'm going to just turn this to a staff moment. So we did a staff engagement survey, and we asked many more questions and different questions to the standard one that we've been asking for 15 years. We just decided we needed a change of pace on it. And, I, you know, and this is going to sound like a quite strange thing to say, but we were able to use the information we gathered from it to identify that our least satisfied group of staff were those that identified 
as non-heterosexual. Now, to be able to do that at the Sheffield College almost four years in, I felt kind of weirdly delighted. And it, you know, I've got a piece of work to do on that. But to know it so that you can deal with it is, is a step forward. And so, so to take an, we took a different approach. And by taking a different approach, we can now kind of identify at better levels of detail what we need to do or who else we need to talk to and what we need to talk about. And so, but, but the staff survey came back with very high, very positive um, inclusivity uh, commentary. So the, 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 the free text was great, but it's not enough still. You know, there's no. still more to do. So yeah, in, it's, broadly, it's interesting. Okay, so staff engagement um, in terms of uh, inclusion, um, you, you think is broadly where it should be, but um, in terms of the student population, um, and their perspective on inclusion and safe spaces. Would you say that's still, um, no, I, still no, more think, work to do? So they're respected that we're an inclusive organisation, that we have safe spaces. But, but that's what the survey tells us. And what I want to know is what do students say? So, yeah. so I'm, I keep, I'm, the survey leads you to then want to uh, ask for focus groups or more activity and that's what I push out to the student union because what, what I don't want to say is come and talk to the principal nobody ever wants to come and talk to the principal you know just generally but if I ask the student union to push that out and then I kind of I can get an invite or I don't need to get an invite I, I'm just interested but I don't you know if the president of the student union can champion this and find out what we need to do that's fabulous and that's where we're at at the moment so we've gone beyond feeling that this the survey is telling us we're okay. So I'm pushing for, can we talk to people now then? You know, we've got a survey, looks fine, looks good. Everything seems like high, high rates of satisfaction, if you like, but what next? Let's, let's go yes. and ask some very, you know, more direct questions. And it's also good as well to look under the survey because you'd need to look at things like what percentage responded to the survey, who was actually asking the questions, how the questions were asked, if, you, if only 30% of the population responding, and of that, the response was 60-40, well, it's difficult to infer that yeah. it's all good. It, you know, the ones who responded may be comfortable, but there might be a silent majority who are not happy, but for whatever reason, are not sharing it. But um, yeah. no, thank you for that. I'm just looking at the time. Uh, Professor Hilton, I know we ran a little bit late, but I want to leave space for questions from the other commissioners. Would you like to stop there or do I ask one more? Uh, no, because uh, we don't have space for no. questions. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, because we have an, another session in in less than four minutes, uh, less than five. Yeah, less than five minutes. Um, well, I'll stop there then. So, so uh, Angela, it, it's been it's been a, a, um, a very informative session. I and there's been so much information. I'm just wondering whether I've missed the 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 uh, I, well i'm just wondering whether i've missed the 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 explanation around the 17 percentage points attainment gap at hg i know you've got four, 405 students at, at, at level four and above and in old money that's year one of a degree um uh so is are you are you confident that we've we've covered that the the and, and yeah, is, so, is it still there yeah, that seventeen yeah. percentage point attainment gap at AG? No, no. So the gap is reduced. Um, there's, I'm trying to think which program it is, but my explanation. The students chose to join an. So usually what happens is the students will do level four and level five with us and level six at the, at the university. Mm -hmm. On this particular cohort of students, they chose to leave at the end of level four and join the university cohort at level five, mm -hmm. but they remain on our statistics okay. because they enrolled with us for two years. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a retention gap. Right. So, so it's the difference the between who did we keep and who passed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you, so, do you anticipate then, if there is an attainment gap this this year, that it's likely to be close to the four percentage yeah. points that you had before? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, yes, the gaps the gap will close, but 
the other thing is some of the programs are radically different so some of the things that i'm interested in is we've closed quite a few of our um, level four plus provision and changed the validating body we've changed the type of program mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. i think that will make a big difference to the way students are experiencing learning positively i hope and so the reports that I see from my team are telling me that in FE there are very few gaps and in HE the gaps are much narrower. They're yeah. not, they've, not, they've not gone, but they are much narrower. Mm. And on that positive point, um, I'll have to draw this, this session to a close. Angela, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Um, I know there were, you know, there are still lots of other questions that, that people would like to, to ask. Um, Could I suggest, but, Professor Hilton, that we maybe, if Angela's happy, we maybe collate some of those questions and send them on to Angela to respond separately, maybe add to the evidence, if that's helpful? Well, I think it's always great when we give um, principals homework. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Angela, if, if, you're, if you're open to, to continue with the dialogue, where we have some additional questions, are you happy for us to send them through to, for you to fill them? Yeah. They, they, yeah? You, okay. Yeah, of course. Well, we yeah. can talk face to face. We don't mind either in writing or face to face either way. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll, no, I'm absolutely happy to, I, I, you know, s send me anything and we'll, if we can, if we can get something back in the diary, let's do it. Yeah. 